Chapter 41 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. The Christian Message. Lesson 41. The Christian Message. Number 1. A Philosophy or a Testimony In the student's textbook, the Christian message has been represented as primarily a piece of good news, a story of something that happened. That representation does not pass unchallenged today. Many suppose that the message of the apostles was concerned simply with reflection upon eternal truths. For centuries, it is said in effect, Men had been reflecting upon the problems of God and the world and sin. What the apostles did in Jerusalem and elsewhere was simply to provide better instruction on these great themes. Jesus had taught men that God is the Father. The apostles simply continued his teaching. Such a view, of course, can be held only by rejecting or distorting the testimony of the New Testament. If the book of the Acts is correct— if Paul is correct, then the preaching that found at the apostolic church was not better instruction about old facts, but information about a new fact. Before Jesus came, the world was lost under sin, but Jesus lived and died and rose again and gave salvation to all who would receive. According to the New Testament, Jesus did not come to tell men that they were God's children he came to make them God's children. John one twelve, Galatians 4, 3 through 5. Without him, they were under God's wrath and curse. But by faith in him, by acceptance of his sacrifice of himself for them, by receiving from his spirit the power to believe, they could call God Father. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus was presented as more than a teacher. He was presented as a Savior. Number two, the effects of the message. One, in the apostolic age, the effects of that presentation have been considered briefly in the student's textbook, and what was said there might easily be supplemented. The conversion of the 3,000 was only a beginning. The new spirit of the Christian community the brotherly love and holy joy of the disciples, indeed everything that will be treated in the lessons of the quarter, were the result of a simple piece of news. By the wise men of the world, then as now, the message was despised, but the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 1 Corinthians one twenty five. This lesson offers a singular opportunity to the teacher. The Christian message in the apostolic church was a message of power. The story of its progress is full of dramatic vigor. It appeals even to the non-Christian historian. The story of the apostolic age is full of surprises. The sudden transformation of bitter Jewish enemies into humble disciples, the triumphant spread of the faith when everything seemed opposed, the establishment of Christian churches in the very centers of pagan vice, the astonishingly rapid preparation for the conquest of the empire, and all this accomplished not by worldly wisdom, but by simple men who only had a bit of news, a bit of news and God. 2. In the history of the church. The triumphs of the gospel, however, were not confined to the age of the apostles. The apostolic age was prophetic of the Christian centuries. There were many days of darkness, but the church always emerged again triumphant. So it will be today. God has not deserted his people. He will attest his truth with the power of his spirit. There is no room for discouragement. One thing, however, should be remembered. The victories of the church are victories, not of brilliant preachers, not of human wisdom or human goodness, but of the cross of Christ. Under that banner, all true conquests move.
Number three, the presentation of the message. The Christian message was presented in the apostolic church in many different ways. The gospel was everywhere essentially the same, but the presentation of it was adapted to the needs of particular hearers, and the understanding of it became ever more complete under the illumination of the Holy Spirit. It is interesting to collect the various types of missionary speeches that are found in the New Testament. 1. The Missionary Preaching of the Jerusalem Church The early chapters of the Acts preserve a number of speeches that were addressed to Jews. As might have been expected, these speeches are intended primarily to move the Messiahship of Jesus. If that could be proved, then among the Jews the rest would follow. The Messiahship was proved first by an appeal to the Scriptures, and second by the fact of the Resurrection. Even the death of Jesus on the cross, which was to the Jews a stumbling block, was predicted by the prophets, and so served to prove that Jesus was the promised one. The resurrection was also predicted, and the resurrection was established first by the simple testimony of eyewitnesses, and second by the wonderful works of the living Christ. These early speeches contain only a little of the full truth of the gospel. In them, for example... The significance of the death of Christ as an atonement for sin is not fully explained. Such omissions were due no doubt to two causes. A. Limitations due to the hearers. In the first place, the peculiar needs of the hearers had to be considered. The hearers were Jews. To them, the death of the Messiah was an unheard of paradox. To them, the cross was a stumbling block. Before the inner meaning of the crucifixion could be explained, obviously the objections derived from it needed to be overcome. The first task of the missionaries was to show that Jesus, although he had been crucified, was the Messiah. That was done by an appeal to prophecy and to the plain fact of the resurrection. After conviction had thus been produced, it would be time enough to show that what was at first regarded as a stumbling block was really the supreme act of divine grace. B. Limitations due to an early stage of revelation. The omissions in the early speeches were due, however, not merely to the peculiar needs of the hearers, but also to limitations in the knowledge of the apostles. Christian truth was not all revealed at once. Undoubtedly, the full explanation of the cross, the full exposition of the atonement, was revealed only when the disciples could bear it. Such is the divine method, even in Revelation. The disciples were brought gradually, by the gracious leading of the Holy Spirit, into ever richer knowledge of the truth. C. The Significance of the Cross Nevertheless, the meagerness of the early teaching must not be exaggerated. In the very first missionary speech of Peter, Jesus was represented as delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2.23 What happened by the determinate counsel of God was no meaningless chance. The crucifixion was not a victory of evil over God. It must have had some beneficent purpose. Furthermore, Jesus himself had explained what that purpose was. He had spoken of giving his life a ransom for many. Mark 10:45. Still more plainly, on the last solemn Passover evening, he had represented his death as sacrificial. These words were certainly not forgotten in the Jerusalem church. They were called to mind in the repeated celebration of the Lord's Supper and must have formed the subject of meditation. The Jerusalem Christians knew that Jesus' death was a death on their behalf. D. The Lordship of Jesus The Lordship of Jesus, moreover, was fully recognized from the very beginning. The risen Christ had ascended into glory and had poured forth his mighty spirit. The believer was no mere learner of the words of a dead teacher. He was called into communion with the Lord and Savior. Such communion meant nothing less than an entirely new life, in which sin could have no rightful place. It was a life of conflict, but also a life of hope.
the Savior would come again in like manner as he had gone. The spiritual victory already won would be perfected by a final victory in every realm. 2. The Missionary Preaching of Paul The gospel of the early preachers was a glorious message. It was a piece of glad tidings, such as the world had never known. Yet even greater things were in store. Even more wondrous mysteries were to be revealed. They were revealed especially through the instrumentality of the Apostle Paul. The gospel had been preached from the beginning, but much of its deeper meaning was reserved for Paul. A. Truth and Error In the teaching of Paul, truth became plainer by being contrasted with error. The original apostles had really been trusting in the atonement of Christ for salvation, but now that trust became plainer and more explicit by being contrasted with works of the law. The original apostles had really grasped the inner significance of Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but now that significance became still plainer by the contrast with Pharisaic legality. Now at length, the death and resurrection were represented sharply and clearly as great representative acts in which the believer shares through faith. The original apostles were not overwhelmed and confused by the new revelation. They recognized the grace of God. Their perfect agreement with Paul exhibited the unity of the apostolic gospel. Scarcely anything would be more interesting than a full collection of the missionary speeches of Paul. Such a collection, however, has not been preserved. The writings that we possess from the hand of Paul are not missionary addresses, but letters written to those who were already Christians. We should not, however, complain of the providence of God. God has not thought good to give us everything, but what he has given us is enough. B. Information provided by the Acts. The book of of the Acts, in the first place, affords valuable information. The author was interested indeed, chiefly in beginnings. The examples of Paul's missionary preaching, which Luke has preserved, are perhaps preliminary to evangelism rather than evangelism itself. The speech at Pisidian Antioch shows how Paul proved the Messiahship of Jesus. In winning the Jews, that proof was the first step. The Pauline gospel indeed appears, but it appears only at the very end of the speech. The speech at Athens is still more clearly of preliminary character. Monotheism needed to be established before the gospel of Christ could be understood. Despite their necessary limitations, however, these speeches are instructive. They show in the first place that Paul adapted his preaching to the needs of his hearers. He did not preach the same sermon mechanically to all. He sought really to win men over. He began with what his hearers could understand. They show in the second place that all preliminary matters were kept strictly subordinate. These matters were not made an end in themselves, as is often the case in the Martin Church, but were merely a means to an end. No matter where he began, Paul always proceeded quickly to the center of the gospel. Both at Pisidian Antioch and at Athens, he hastened on to the resurrection. C. Information provided by the epistles. The Pauline epistles in the second place though they are addressed to Christians, really afford sufficient information, at least in outline, about the missionary preaching of Paul. Incidental references are sufficient to show at least that the cross and the resurrection were the center and core of it. The Thessalonians, for example, under the preaching of Paul, turned unto God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivereth us from the wrath to come. This little passage is worth pages of exposition. Preaching to Gentiles is here reviewed in epitome, though of course not with studied symmetry and completeness, 
The knowledge of the one true God formed, of course, for Gentiles, the starting point for all the rest. But from that starting point, the preacher at once proceeded to tell of the work of Christ. Just as illuminating are passages like 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Galatians 3.1. In Corinth, Paul knew nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. In Galatia, the story of the cross was made so plain that it was as though Jesus Christ crucified were held up before the eyes of the Galatians on a great picture or placard. The famous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 8, is, however, perhaps clearest of all. At the very beginning, Paul had spoken of the death of Christ and the resurrection. The death, moreover, was not presented as a mere inspiring story of a holy martyrdom, but as a death for our sins, and the resurrection was supported not primarily by an inward experience, but by simple testimony. Apostolic preaching was everywhere essentially the same. The apostles never began, like many Martin preachers, with exhortation, though they proceeded to exhortation. They always began with facts. What was always fundamental was the simple story of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ crucified and risen was the subject of the good news that conquered the world. When will the Martin church take up the message with new power? We do not know. The times are in God's hand. But when the blessed day comes, it will be a day of victory. End of chapter 41, read by Jacqueline Tyler, Owasso, Oklahoma, March 5th, 2022. Chapter 42 of The Literature and History of New Testament Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. Lesson 42. The Word and the Sacraments. This lesson and the two following are intended primarily to encourage in the student the diligent use of the means of grace. The wise teacher will keep the practical purpose steadily in view. That practical purpose may now be examined a little more in detail. Why should the example of the apostolic church be followed in the matter of Bible reading, of the sacraments, of prayer, of Christian meetings? What was God's purpose in providing these simple exercises of the Christian life? What benefit do we receive from them? Perhaps the briefest and simplest answer is that we receive from them what is often known as reality in religion. First, reality in religion. Many Christians are puzzled by the lack of the sense of reality in their Christian life. They have believed in Christ, but often he seems far from them. It is not so much that positive doubts have arisen, though certainly the lack of fervency gives doubt its opportunity. Rather, it is an inexplicable dulling of the spiritual eye. The gospel still seems wonderful to the intellect, but to the heart it has somehow lost its power. 1. The Need of Diligence This condition is due very often to a neglect of the means of grace, which we shall study in this lesson and the two lessons following. It is a great mistake to suppose that the spiritual life is altogether beyond our control. Undoubtedly, it is instituted only by an immediate exercise of the divine power, independent of the human will. Undoubtedly, the maintenance of it would be impossible without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, in that work of maintenance, we have a very definite part. Many Christians suppose that any performance of religious exercises, merely for duty's sake, without immediate spiritual profit, is a mere form. This supposition is erroneous. Not performance of religious exercises without spiritual profit, but performance of them without the desire of spiritual profit, is formalism. The appointed means of grace must continue to be used even when no immediate benefit can be discerned. In the reading of the Bible, in prayer, in public worship, the Christian should, first of all, do his duty. The result may safely be left to God. 2. The Danger of Neglect 
Without such attention to duty, the Christian life becomes merely a matter of inclination. In times of great spiritual distress, we call upon God for comfort and help. But in the long, level weeks of comparative prosperity, we think we can do without Him. Such thoughts are the height of folly. God is not our servant. He is not one who can be safely left out of our thoughts, except when we think we especially need Him. If we neglect God in time of prosperity, we may call in vain when adversity comes. 3. The Reward of Duty The religious life is not merely a matter of inclination. It must be diligently fostered. Such attention to duty, however, will never be merely drudgery. It may begin with drudgery, and it may become drudgery again at times, but, if persisted in, it will be an ever-widening avenue of joy and power. Second, the study of the Bible. The reading of the Bible is such a simple thing, and so obviously necessary to the Christian life, that it requires comparatively little discussion. Despite its indispensableness, however, it is being sadly neglected today. Our fathers learned the Bible with a thoroughness which today is almost unknown. The change is full of danger. A Bible-reading church is possessed of power. Without the Bible, the church loses its identity altogether and sinks back into the life of the world. The process, unfortunately, has gone to considerable lengths. How may it now be checked? 1. The study should be made interesting. Something, no doubt, may be done by making the study of the Bible more interesting. Certainly, the Bible does not yield an interest to any other branch of knowledge. The Bible does not merely present spiritual truth. It presents it in a wonderfully rich and varied way. If the study of the Bible is stupid, the fault lies not in the subject matter, but in the student or in the teacher. 2. The Motive of Duty Nevertheless, a mere appeal to the interest of the students is entirely insufficient. After all, there is no royal road to learning, not to biblical learning, any more than to the learning of the world. Solid education can never be attained without hard work. Education that is easy is pretty sure to be worthless. Especially at the beginning, the chief appeal in education must be to a sense of duty. So it is in the case of the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. Obviously, it may not be neglected. Let us study it, then, primarily because the study of it is an obvious duty. As a matter of fact, the duty will soon become a pleasure. But let that not be the motive. Let us read the Bible regularly and persistently, in entire independence of changing impulse. That is the kind of study that is blessed of God. Superficial study, determined by mere inclination, may at first sight seem just as good. But when adversity or temptation comes, then the difference appears. It is the difference between a house built upon the sand and a house built upon the rock. The two houses look alike, but when the rains descend and the floods come, one falls and the other stands. The Christian whose knowledge of the Bible is obtained by old-fashioned, patient study, never interrupted by changing inclination, has dug deep and founded his house upon the rock. 3. The Example of the Apostolic Church The example of the Apostolic Church in the matter of the means of grace is especially significant. In the Apostolic Age, it might have seemed as though these simple exercises might be dispensed with. What need of regularly appointed forms when the Holy Spirit was so immediately manifested? Yet, as a matter of fact, all the essential forms of Christian custom were present from the beginning. Regularity and diligence were cherished, even in the first exuberance of the Jerusalem church. Enthusiasm of spiritual life did not lead to the despising of ordinary helps. The early disciples continued steadfastly, day by day, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread at home, they took their food with gladness and singleness of heart. Acts chapter 2 verse 46 The use which the apostolic church made of the Bible might seem to some modern men particularly surprising. A book religion, men say, is a stagnant religion. Living faith is independent of dead documents. It is only when the early enthusiasm is lost that belief becomes crystallized in submission to venerable authority. This sort of religious philosophy shatters on the plain facts of the apostolic age. 
Admittedly, that was an age of freshness and independence. There never has been such an outburst of religious enthusiasm as that, which planted the faith in Jerusalem and carried it like wildfire throughout the civilized world. Yet another fact is equally plain. This wonderful enthusiasm was coupled with the utmost reverence for a book. Nothing could exceed the unquestioning submission which the early Christians paid to the Old Testament scriptures. The exuberance of apostolic Christianity was intertwined with a book religion. The explanation, of course, is simple. Submission to a human book means stagnation, but genuine submission to the Word of God means always what it meant in the apostolic age, heroism and victory and life. Third, baptism. One, baptism and circumcision. The sacrament of baptism had its truest predecessor in circumcision, the Old Testament sign of union with the covenant people. Baptism, as well as circumcision, is a sign of the covenant, though the varied symbolism marks the advance of the new covenant over the old. 2. Christian Baptism and the Baptism of John In form, moreover, and to a considerable extent also in meaning, Christian baptism in the early church was prepared for by the baptism of John the Baptist, which had even been continued by the disciples of Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 Both the baptism of John and Christian baptism symbolized cleansing from sin. Compare Acts chapter 2, verse 38, with Matthew chapter 3, verses 6 and 11. Christian baptism, however, differed from every rite that had preceded it by its definite reference to Christ and by its definite connection with the new manifestation of the Holy Spirit. 3. Baptism into Christ In the apostolic writings, baptism is sometimes spoken of as baptism into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27, Romans chapter 6 verse 3. The meaning of this phrase has often been obscured, both in translation and in interpretation. The phrase into Christ, in this connection, means something more than with reference to Christ. It means rather into a position within Christ. The Christian, according to a common Pauline expression, is in Christ. He is in such close union with Christ that the life of Christ might almost be described as the atmosphere which he breathes. To be baptized into Christ means to come by baptism into this state of blessed union with the Savior. 4. Baptism and Faith At this point, however, a serious question arises. How can baptism be described as the means by which the Christian comes into union with Christ, when at other times... Salvation is declared to be by faith. One solution of the difficulty would be simply to say that baptism and faith are both necessary. A man must believe if he is to be saved, but he must also be baptized. Clearly, however, this view does not represent the meaning of the New Testament. The passages where faith alone is represented as the condition of salvation are too strong, especially the vigorous contrast which Paul sets up between faith and works prevents any inclusion of such a work as baptism, along with faith as an additional condition of acceptance with God. The true solution is that baptism is related to faith, or rather, to the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit, as the sign is related to the thing signified. Baptism represents the work of the Spirit. It is a means which the Spirit uses. If it stood alone, it would be a meaningless form. But when it is representative of spiritual facts, it becomes a channel of divine grace. Fourth, the Lord's Supper. The celebration of the Lord's Supper in the Jerusalem church was probably connected in some way with the breaking of bread, which is mentioned in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Every common meal was an expression of Christian communion, but the solemn words of Christ at the Last Supper could not have been forgotten. Here, as so often, the book of the Acts affords little information about the internal affairs of the church. Fortunately, Paul, in the first epistle to the Corinthians, is far more explicit, and inferences can be drawn from him with regard even to Jerusalem. Paul represents the Lord's Supper not as an innovation, but as something that had been given to the Corinthians as a matter of course at the very beginning of their Christian lives.
Evidently, the sacrament was celebrated universally in the churches. Paul had received the account of the institution of the supper from the Lord through the first Christians. In Corinth, as was also probably the case in the early days in Jerusalem, the supper was celebrated in connection with the common meals of the Christian community. Certain abuses had arisen. The rich brought food and drink with them and feasted luxuriously in the presence of their poorer brethren. The spiritual significance of the supper was profaned. Against such abuses, Paul enunciates the great principle that the supper does not work a magical benefit. If partaken of irreverently, it brings condemnation rather than blessing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 through 22, the Lord's Supper appears as a warning against participation in heathen feasts. The pagan fellow citizens of the Corinthian Christians, by their religious feasts, held communion with idols. The Christians cannot remain with them and, at the same time, commune with Christ. A man must make his choice, either Christ or idols. He must choose either the Lord's Supper or heathen feasts. Here the Lord's Supper appears especially as a sign of communion with Christ, as in chapter 11, verse 26, it appears especially as a commemoration of his death. These two aspects of the Supper, and their intimate connection with each other, should now be explained a little more in detail. 1. A Representation of the Death of Christ The Lord's Supper, as is observed in the student's textbook, is representative of the death of Christ on our behalf. In many passages of the New Testament, the significance of that death is explained in words. In the Lord's Supper, it is represented in visible form. The Lord's Supper is related to the story of the gospel, as the picture, or the acted representation, is related to ordinary discourse. In the broken bread and poured out wine, we not only apprehend with the mind, but actually see the broken body and shed blood of the Lord. Of course, that does not mean, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches, that the bread and wine are actually, by a miracle, at every celebration of the supper, changed into the body and blood of Christ, but only that they represent them. The very simplicity of the sacrament should have guarded against misinterpretation. An actual image of the dying Savior might lead to idolatry, or to an overemphasis upon the details of the scene on Calvary. The simple representation that Christ ordained is enough to be vivid without being enough to become misleading. 2. A representation of our union with Christ. The supper represents the death of Christ, not as a mere drama, remote from us, but as a death on our behalf. In the supper, we do not merely witness the breaking of the bread and the pouring out of the wine. We partake of the bread and wine ourselves. Plainly, the symbolism means that we who are disciples of Christ do not merely admire the holy self-sacrifice of Christ, but rather receive the benefits of it. We feed upon the body and blood of Christ in the high spiritual sense that by faith we obtain from Christ's death pardon for our sins and a fresh start in the full favor of God. These benefits we obtain not by our own efforts, but by a free gift. It was Christ himself who broke the bread and poured out the wine on the last evening before the crucifixion. It is also Christ who, through his minister, at every celebration of the sacrament, is represented as offering to us his body and blood. The Lord's Supper, therefore, is not merely a commemoration of an event in the past. It is also a symbol of a present fact. It symbolizes the blessed communion of believers with one another and with Christ. Fifth, the sacraments more than a proclamation of the gospel. So far we have considered the sacraments merely as one means of proclaiming the gospel. The Bible proclaims the gospel in words. The sacraments proclaim it in pictures. Even if that were all, the sacraments would be of great value. By these symbolic actions, the gospel message attains a new vividness and definiteness. As a matter of fact, however, baptism and the Lord's Supper are more than peculiar ways of making a vivid presentation of the gospel. They were instituted especially by Christ, and the Holy Spirit has connected with them a special blessing. The Spirit can use what means He will, and He has chosen to use these. In the Lord's Supper, for example, the Lord is really present in the midst of His people. He is not present, indeed, in a corporal and carnal manner, 
but his spiritual presence is a blessed fact. The sacraments, therefore, should not be neglected. In themselves, when unaccompanied by faith, they are valueless, and they are not necessary for salvation. Ordinarily, however, they are a chosen means of blessing. When God wills, other means can take their place. But under all ordinary circumstances, they are used. Certainly they should not be neglected without adequate cause. They have been provided by God, and God is wiser than men. The Lord's Supper should be received with solemnity, but sometimes young Christians have perhaps an exaggerated dread of it. The error of the Corinthian Christians should indeed be carefully avoided. Wanton carelessness in the solemn act will, of course, bring the condemnation of God. But the supper does not demand perfection, even in faith. On the contrary, it is intended to help to remove imperfection. The Lord's Supper is not a dangerous bit of magic, where any little mistake might break the charm. Let us partake of it with a simple prayer, and leave the results to the goodness of God. End of chapter 42 Recording by Olivia Chapter 43 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresson Machen Prayer 1. The Answerer of Prayer The prayers of the apostolic age reveal with startling clearness the apostolic conception of God. And one chief reason why our prayers fall short of the apostolic standard is that our idea of God is different. 1. God is a person In the first place, true prayer always conceives of God as a person whereas much of modern religious thinking conceives of him as only another name for the world. Human life, it is said, is a part of the life of God. Every man, to some degree, is divine. Such a philosophy makes prayer logically impossible. It is impossible for us to speak to an impersonal world force, of which we ourselves are merely an expression. The personal distinction between man and God is absolutely essential to prayer. The transcendence of God as over against the world is grandly expressed in the prayer of the Jerusalem Church, which was studied in the student's textbook. The Jerusalem Christians addressed God as the Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. Acts 4.24 God, in other words, is not another name for the world, but creator of the world. He is indeed present in the world. Not a single thing that happens is independent of him. The world would not continue for a moment without God's sustaining hand. But that means not that God is identical with the world, but that he is master of it. God pervades all things. He is present everywhere, but he is also free. That conception pervades all the prayers of the Apostolic Church. In all of them, man comes to God as one person to another. God is free. God can do what he will. Through Christ he is our Father. He is not bound by his own works. He is independent of nature. He will overrule all things for the good of his children. Such is the God that can answer prayer. 2. God is an infinite and holy person. If, however, the prayers of the apostolic age conceive of God as a person, they also conceive of him as very different from men. Here also they provide a salutary example for the modern church. Many devout Christians of today, in avoiding the error which has just been described, in thinking of God plainly as a person, are inclined to fall into the opposite mistake. 
in their clear realization of God as a person, they think of him as a person exactly like ourselves. They regard the difference between God and man as a difference of degree rather than a difference of kind. They think of God as merely a greater man in the sky. The result of such thinking is disastrous for prayer. Prayer, to be sure, is here not absolutely destroyed. Communion with God remains possible, but such communion is degraded. Communion loses that sense of mystery and awe which properly belongs to it. Man becomes too familiar with God. God takes merely the leading place in a circle of friends. Religion descends to the plane of other relationships. Prayer to such a God is apt to become irreverent. If our prayers are to lift us fully into the presence of God, they must never lie on the same plane with the communion that we enjoy with our fellow men. They must be filled with a profound sense of God's majesty and power. The danger of permitting prayer on account of its very privilege to become a commonplace thing is one that threatens us all. It may be overcome, however, in the first place by the contemplation of nature. The heavens declare the glory of God and a firmament show of his handiwork. And it is a terrible, mysterious God that they reveal. The stupendous vastness of the universe and the baffling mystery of the surrounding infinity oppress the thoughtful mind with a profound sense of insignificance. And God is the maker and ruler of it all, the one in whom all the mystery finds its explanation. Such is the employment of nature in the prayer of the Jerusalem Church. Acts 4.24 All the prayers of the Apostolic Church illustrate the principle which is now being emphasized. There is nothing trite or vulgar about the prayers that are contained in the New Testament. They are all characterized by wonderful dignity and reverence. If the infinity and omnipotence of God should prevent any irreverence in our prayers, the thought of his holiness is perhaps even more overwhelming. We are full of impurity. Who can stand before the white light of God's awful judgment throne? 3. God is a gracious person. Nevertheless, despite the majesty and holiness of God, he invites us into his presence. It is a stupendous wonder. No reason could have shown it to be probable. Only ignorance can regard it as a matter of course. If God were only a somewhat greater man, there would have been comparatively little mystery in prayer. But communion with the infinite and eternal and holy one, the unfathomed cause of all things, is the wonder of wonders. It is a wonder of God's grace. It is too wonderful to be true, yet it has become true in Christ. True prayer brings us not before some God of our own devising, before whom we could stand in our own merit without fear, and into the dread presence of Jehovah. Let us not hesitate to go. God has called us. He loves us as a father, far more than we can ever love him. Prayer is full of joy. The joy is so great that it is akin to fear. 2. The influence of Jesus' teaching upon the prayers of the Apostolic Church. In studying the prayers of the Apostolic Age, it must always be remembered they stood upon the foundation of Jesus' example and precept. 1. The Example of Jesus With all his power and holiness, Jesus was not above asking for strength to perform his gracious work. After that long, wearying day in Capernaum, he departed into a desert place and there prayed. Mark 1, 35 In the hour of agony in Gethsemane, he prayed a truly human, though holy prayer. Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Remove this cup from me. How be it, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Chapter 14, 36 Prayer, moreover, was not something which Jesus reserved for himself. 
Clearly it was a privilege which he extended to all his disciples. In the prayer that he taught his disciples, he summed up all that our prayer should be. Matthew 6, 9-15 2. God as Father One thing in particular was derived by the Apostolic Church from Jesus, the conception of God as Father. This conception appears in the epistles of Paul as a matter of course. Evidently, it was firmly established among the readers. It no longer required defence or explanation, yet it had not lost, through long reputation, one whit of its freshness. In Paul, it is never a mere phrase, but always a profound spiritual fact. Obviously, this idea of the fatherhood of God was a particular importance of prayer. It taught the disciples to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence, as children to a father, able and ready to help them. A characteristic way of addressing God, even in the Gentile churches of Paul, was Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6, Romans 8, 15. The Aramaic word Abba is sufficient to show that this hallowed usage was based ultimately upon the teaching and example of Jesus. The word was the very one that Jesus had used both in his own prayers. For example, in Gethsemane, Mark 14, 36, and in the Lord's Prayer, which he taught to his disciples. 3. The Rite of Sonship What needs to be observed especially, however, is that the right of addressing God as our Father was not in the apostolic church extended to all men. Certainly, no justification for such an extension could have been found in the teaching of Jesus. It is not the unbelieving multitude but his own disciples to whom Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 5, 1, 6, verse 9, Luke 11, 1 and 2. Paul is even more explicit. The cry, Abba, Father, was to him a proof that a great change had taken place. Those who had been formerly under bondage to the world had now become sons of God. This change Paul represents especially under the figure of adoption. Galatians 4, verse 5 Men have to be adopted by God before they can call God Father. Adoption is accomplished only by the work of Christ. Verses 4 and 5 4. The intercession of the Spirit The cry, Abba, Father, can never be uttered by sinful men alone, but only by the power of Christ's Spirit. The prayers even of the redeemed are faulty. But the Holy Spirit takes up their cry. In like manner the Spirit also help of our infirmity, for we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8, 26, 27 There lies the true ground of confidence in prayer. Prayer does not derive its efficacy from any merit of its own, but only from the goodness of God. Let us not worry too much as to whether our prayers are good or bad. Let them only be simple and sincere. God knows our weakness. His Spirit will make intercession for us far better than we can intercede for ourselves. 3. Public Prayers of the Apostolic Church a few individual prayers that have been preserved in the apostolic age are for the most part prayers of a more or less public character. The spontaneous outpourings of the hearts of individual saints before God would usually not be put into writing. The full secrets of the prayer closet are known to God alone. 1. Spontaneity and Sincerity Nevertheless, the public character of the prayers of the New Testament does not mean that they are cold and formal. On the contrary, at a time when set liturgies had not yet been formed, 
public prayer possessed all the spontaneity of a more private devotions for to the listening congregation or of a circle of readers did not bring any hampering restraint there is sterling sincerity about all the prayers or fragments of prayers in the new testament two dignity the spontaneity and sincerity of the prayers however did not involve any sacrifice of dignity the prayer of the jerusalem congregation acts four twenty four to thirty is a marvel of exalted speech its employment of scripture phrase is an admirable example for public prayers of all ages that prayer received a glorious answer indeed the true prayer of the congregation never remains unheard christ's promise is always fulfilled the two or three are gathered together in his name there is he in the midst of them in the epistles there is to be found here and there what may be called if not the beginning of liturgy at any rate material of which a magnificent liturgy can be formed the benediction of hebrews thirteen twenty twenty one for example is characterized by a splendid rhythm as well as by true evangelical fervour such a prayer lifts the hearts of the congregation up into the presence of god there is use for beauty even in prayer and the truest beauty is to be found in the prayers of the bible four private prayers of the apostolic church the apostolic guidance in prayer extends even to those private prayers which no one hears except god in this field the epistles of paul are of special value more fully than in any other one man of the apostolic age paul has revealed the very secrets of christian experience and that experience is rooted in prayer a glance at the beginnings and endings of the epistles will be sufficient to show how fundamental prayer was in paul's life news of the churches was never received without issuing at once in thanksgiving or in intercession and paul desires not merely the good wishes but the prayers of his beloved converts paul practised what he preached when he urged the thessalonican christians to pray without ceasing in the thessalonians five seventeen compare chapters one verse three two verse thirteen romans one verse 9 2 timothy 1 verse 3 evidently moreover he regarded prayer as something far more than an incidental expression of the christian life he believed in its real efficacy with the ruler of the world 5 my power is made perfect in weakness one passage particularly will repay special study in 2 corinthians 12 8 9. We have information about the most intimate, the most personal of the prayers of Paul. The apostle had been afflicted with a persistent illness. It had apparently hampered him in his work and caused him acute distress. In his trouble he called upon the Lord, and by that prayer Paul's affliction has been made to redound to the lasting instruction and encouragement of the church. 1. Prayer Concerning Physical Ills In the first place, the prayer concerns not spiritual matters or the needs of the church at large, but a simple affair of the physical life. As life is constituted here on earth, we are intimately connected with the physical world. The body is necessary to the soul, but God is master of earth as well as of heaven. Even the simplest needs of life may be laid before him in prayer. To teach us that, we have here the example of Paul, as well as the precept of the Saviour himself. 2. The answer. In the second place, the prayer was answered, and answered in a very instructive way. The illness was not removed, but it was made an instrument of blessing. The purpose of it was revealed, my power said christ is made perfect in weakness physical suffering is worthwhile 
if it leads to heroism and faith. Such is often the Lord's will. He himself trod the path of suffering before us, and in his case, as in ours, the path led to glory. 3. The Prayer Addressed to Christ In the third place, this prayer was addressed not to God the Father, but to Christ. Compare Acts 7, 59, 60. Without doubt, the Lord, in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, as practically always in the Pauline epistles, refers to Christ. Usually in the New Testament, prayer is addressed through Christ to God the Father. But there is no reason why it should not be addressed to the Son. The Son as well as the Father is a living person, and the Son as well as the Father is God. It is well that we have apostolic examples for prayer addressed directly to the Saviour. Christ to Paul was no mere instrument in salvation, that had served its purpose and was then removed. He was alive and sovereign, and the relation to him was a relation of love. In a time of acute physical distress, Paul turned to the Saviour. Three times he called and then the answer came. The answer will always come in the Lord's way, not in ours, but the Lord's way is always best. End of chapter 43。Chapter 44 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. The Congregation 1. Congregational Meetings in Palestine In studying the congregational meetings of the apostolic churches, it must be remembered that the Christian community in Jerusalem continued for many years its participation in the worship of temple and synagogue. Specially Christian meetings, therefore, were at first not the sole expression of the collective worship of the Jerusalem Christians. Nevertheless, such meetings were undoubtedly held even from the beginning. From the days when the 120 brethren were gathered together before Pentecost, the church was not without some outward expression of its distinctive life. First, as indicated in the Acts, the circumstances of such early meetings of the congregation are, however, obscure. The very considerable number of the converts, Acts 2, verses 41 and 47, chapter 4, verse 4, chapter 5, verse 14, would perhaps sometimes make it difficult to gather the whole congregation together in one place. If, however, that were done, it would perhaps be usually in some part of the temple area. There seem to have been general meetings, for example, Acts 15, verses 1 to 29, but it is perhaps not necessary to suppose that they included every individual member of the Jerusalem church. Certainly, however, no members of that first Christian community neglected the assembling of themselves together. Evidently, the sense of brotherhood was strongly developed, and evidently it expressed itself not only in the regular relief of the needy, Acts 6.1, but also in meetings for instruction and worship and prayer, chapter 2, verse 42, chapter 4, verses 23 to 31. These meetings were only outward indications of a wonderful unity of mind and heart, chapter 4, verse 32. The cause of that unity was the common possession of the Spirit of God. As might have been expected in a book which is interested chiefly in the outward extension of the kingdom, the book of the Acts gives us little detailed information about the conduct of these earliest Christian meetings. Probably, however, the example of the Jewish synagogue made itself strongly felt. There was no violent break with Judaism. A new spirit was infused into ancient forms. The resemblance between the synagogue service and even the fully developed Christian meetings of today was noted in connection with Lesson 4. Second, as indicated in the Epistle of James. The Epistle of James perhaps helps somewhat to supply the need of detailed information. That Epistle, as was observed in Lesson 32, was written by the head of the Jerusalem Church and probably to Jewish Christians before A.D. 49. Apparently, therefore, we have in James 2, 1-6, to 
some welcome information about Christian assemblies, if not in Jerusalem, at least in other Jewish Christian churches. In verse 2, the word synagogue is applied to the meeting, which is described, but that word in Greek means simply gathering together, almost the same word is used in Hebrews 10.25. The use of the word by James shows simply that at that early time synagogue had not become purely a technical designation of a non-Christian Jewish assembly. So interpreted, the passage in James indicates what might indeed have been expected, that the early Christian meetings were not always perfect. A pharisaical habit of respective persons and desire for the chief seats had crept even into the church. If similar faults appear in modern times, we should not despair, but should fight against them in the spirit of James. 2. Congregational Meetings in the Pauline Churches With regard to the Pauline Churches, information about the conduct of religious services is far more abundant than it is with regard to the Churches of Palestine, for we have here the inestimable assistance of the Pauline Epistles. The first epistle to the Corinthians, especially, is a mine of information, but much can also be learned elsewhere. First, the place of meeting. From the Acts, it appears that Paul regularly began his work in any city by preaching in the Jewish synagogue, but that the opposition of the Jews soon made it necessary to find another meeting place. Often, a private house belonging to one of the converts served the purpose. Romans 16.23 1 Corinthians 16.19, Colossians 4.15, Philemon 2. Sometimes there seem to have been a number of such house churches in the same city, yet common meetings of all the Christians of the city seem also to be presupposed. In Ephesus, Paul used for his evangelistic work a building or a room belonging to a certain Tyrannus, who was probably a rhetorician. The erection of buildings, especially for Christian use, belongs, of course, to a considerably later time. Second, the time of meeting. The frequency of the meetings does not appear and may well have varied according to circumstances. There is some indication, however, that the first day of the week, the present Sunday, was especially singled out for religious services. 1 Corinthians 16.2, Acts 20, verse 7. The same day is apparently called the Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10. Third, temporary gifts of the Spirit. In the actual conduct of the meetings, some features appear which are not to be observed in the modern church. A number of the gifts discussed in 1 Corinthians, chapters 12 to 14, for example, miracles, speaking with tongues, the interpretation of tongues and prophecy in the strict sense, have become extinct. The cessation of them need cause no wonder. The apostolic age was a time of beginnings when the church was being established by the immediate exercise of the power of God. It is no wonder that at such a time the Spirit manifested himself as he did not in later generations. There is a fundamental difference between the apostolic age and all subsequent periods in the history of the church. Nevertheless, all the essential features of our modern church services were present from the earliest time about which we have detailed information. The example of the apostles is here very explicit. Fourth, Scripture reading. In the first place, the Pauline churches certainly practiced the reading of the Bible. That would be proved sufficiently by the evident familiarity of the Christians with the Old Testament scriptures, for in those days such familiarity would undoubtedly be received in large measure by having read the Bible aloud. The example of the synagogue would also have its influence. It must be remembered that some even of the Gentile converts were familiar with the synagogue service before they became Christians. But there is also the explicit testimony of 1 Thessalonians 5.27, Colossians 4.16. There, the reading of Pauline epistles is specifically enjoined. The Apocalypse also was clearly intended to be read aloud, Revelation 1.3.22.18. Fifth, preaching. In the second place, there was preaching. No doubt this part of the service often took a somewhat different form from that which it assumes today. Prophecy, for example, was a kind of preaching which has been discontinued. The exercise of the gift of teaching perhaps corresponded more closely to the sermons of the present day. Certainly an exposition of the scripture passages read would have been according to the analogy of the Jewish synagogue. At any rate, in some form or other, there was certainly instruction in the scriptures and in the gospel and exhortation based on that instruction. Sixth, prayer. In the third place, there was prayer prayer. 
Directions for public prayer are given at some length in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and there are indications that prayer was practiced also in the meetings of the Corinthian church. See, for example, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and 5. Seventh, singing. In the fourth place, there was probably singing, though the direct information about this part of the service is slight. See, for example, 1 Corinthians 14.26. Certainly no elaborate argument is necessary in order to exhibit the scripture warrant for singing in the worship of God. Psalms were sung in Old Testament times to an instrumental accompaniment, and there is no evidence that the customs of the church were changed in this respect under the new dispensation. Indeed, if singing is an expression of joy, it would seem to be especially in place after the fulfillment of the promises has come. 3. Paul's Directions for Congregational Meetings Two features balance each other in Paul's directions for the public worship of the Corinthian church. First, the principle of freedom. In the first place, he is in full sympathy with the freedom and informality that prevailed. There seem to have been no set speakers in Corinth, Every man spoke as the Spirit gave him utterance. The service must have been characterized by great variety. This variety, Paul says, is not disturbing because it finds its higher authority in the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12.4. Second, the principle of dignity. In the second place, however, Paul has a strong sense of dignity. The enthusiastic expression of religious feeling must not degenerate into anything like a senseless orgy. Spiritual gifts, however exalted, are not independent of reason. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 32 and 33. Let all things be done decently and in order. Verse 40. Dignity was to be preserved, moreover, not merely in the ordering of the service itself, but also in the dress and behavior of those who took part. So much, at least, is clear in the difficult passage, chapter 11, verses 2 to 16. Apparently, the full equality which was granted to women in the Christian life led the women of the Corinthian congregation to give a kind of expression to their freedom, which at least at that time was not seemly. Paul detected the danger and guarded against it. The lesson always needs to be learnt. However dignity may be preserved in detail in any particular country and at any particular time, the principle itself should always be borne in mind exactly as Paul enunciated it. At a later period in the apostolic age, the sense of dignity seems to have found expression in a quieter sort of religious service than that which prevailed at the time of 1 Corinthians. The first epistle to Timothy lays great stress upon sobriety and gravity in various departments of the life of the church. Third, the principle of love. These two principles, the principle of freedom and the principle of dignity, are kept each in its own proper place only when they are submitted to the governance of a higher principle. That higher principle is love. The ultimate aim of congregational meetings, according to Paul, is not the benefit of the individual, but the edification of the whole body, and of the stranger who may come in. The man who has the principle of Christian love in his heart, as it is grandly described in 1 Corinthians 13, will never push himself forward in the congregation in such a way as to display his own spiritual gifts at the expense of others. On the other hand, he will not be inclined to check the operations of the Spirit, It is the Spirit alone who can convert the stranger. It is the Spirit alone who can build up Christian people in the life of faith and hope and love. The principle of love is often neglected in the modern church. People say they will not go to church because they get nothing out of it. No doubt they are mistaken. No doubt if they did go, the benefit would appear clearly in the long run in their own lives. But at any rate, they have ignored the highest motive altogether. We should go to church not only to obtain benefit for ourselves, but also, and especially, to benefit our brethren by joining with them in worship, in prayer, and in instruction. End of chapter 44. Chapter 45 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen The Relief of the Needy 
In the student's textbook, special emphasis was laid upon the relief of the needy, as it was practised in the Jerusalem church. Here it may be well to supplement what was there said by a somewhat more detailed treatment of the great collection that was undertaken by Paul. The exposition was served to illustrate the apostolic principles of Christian giving. 1. The Pauline Collection According to 1 Corinthians 1. The Beginning in Galatia and in Corinth Writing from Ephesus during his long stay in that city, Acts 19, verse 1 to 20, verse 1, Paul tells the Corinthians that he had already given directions about the collection to the churches of Galatia, 1 Corinthians 16, 1. He had probably done so either during the second visit to Galatia, Acts 18, 23, or by letter after his arrival at Ephesus. Now at any rate, he asks the Corinthians, very simply and briefly, and evidently presupposing previous information on the part of his readers, to prosecute the collection during his absence, in order that when he should arrive at Corinth, everything might be ready. 2. Laying in store on the first day of the week, the manner in which the collection was to be managed is exceedingly interesting. Upon the first day of the week, Paul says, let each one of you lay by him in store as he may prosper. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2 Apparently no permanent church treasury was used for the reception of the gifts. Every man was to save his own money at home, very much as private collection barrels are used today. The laying up of the money, however, was to take place on the first day of the week. We have here probably an early trace of the Christian Sabbath. Perhaps we may conclude that the act of giving was regarded as a part of religious worship. Such a conclusion is, at any rate, in thorough harmony with all that Paul says about the collection. Some people seem to feel that the taking of an offering rather mars the dignity of a church service. In reality, it has that effect only if it is executed in the wrong spirit. Christian giving is treated by Paul as a legitimate part of the worship of God. 3. The Delegates of the Corinthian Church When Paul should arrive at Corinth, he was to receive the collection and either send or take it to Jerusalem by the help of delegates, whom the Corinthians themselves should choose. The purpose of choosing these delegates appears more plainly in 2 Corinthians. 2. The Pauline Collection According to 2 Corinthians 1. The Situation After the writing of the first epistle to the Corinthians, there had followed a period of serious estrangement between Paul and the Corinthian church. Naturally enough, the collection suffered during this period, as did other Christian activities. At the time of 2 Corinthians, perhaps about a year after the first letter had been written, Paul was obliged to remind his readers that although they had begun the work the year before, much remained still to be done. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 10, 9, verse 2 Nevertheless, Titus, during his recent visit to Corinth, when the repentance of the church had become manifest, had apparently been able to take the matter again in hand. Such seems to be the most probable interpretation of chapters 8, verse 6, 12, verse 18. If Titus did take up the matter on the very visit, when the rebellion against Paul had been only with difficulty quelled, that is a striking indication of the importance which Paul and his associates attributed to the collection. It was not a matter that could wait until some convenient season. It had to be taken in hand vigorously, even perhaps at the risk of misunderstanding and suspicion, the very moment when Paul's relation to the church became again tolerably good. 2. Courtesy of Paul Like all of Paul's management of money matters, his treatment of the collection is characterised by admirable delicacy and tact. Instead of berating the Corinthians roundly for their delinquency, as so many modern organisers would have done, he seeks to win them over by worthier methods. 
he points indeed to the example of the Macedonian Christians in order to fire the zeal of the Corinthians. The poverty of the Macedonian churches had not stood in the way of their liberality. They had given up to their power, and indeed beyond their power. They had given, not of compulsion, but willingly, dedicated themselves as well as their goods to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 5 But the Corinthians are allowed to draw their own conclusion. Paul does not force it upon them. He does not press the matter home brutally. He does not put the Corinthians to shame by expressly pointing out how much more generously the poor Macedonian Christians had contributed than they. Indeed, he gives his readers full credit. He courteously calls their attention to the fact that it was they who had made the beginning, verse 10, and that he had been able to boast of them to the Macedonians so that their zeal had stirred up their Macedonian brethren. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. He appeals especially to the pride that they ought to feel in the boasting which Paul had ventured upon in their behalf. Paul had boasted to the Macedonians that Acacia had been prepared for a year. How sad an end it would be to such boasting if Macedonians should go to Corinth with Paul we should find that the collection was not ready after all. Paul urges the Corinthians not to leave any part of the work until after his arrival. If they do, they will put both him and themselves to shame. Verses 1 to 5 With equal delicacy, Paul hints that the achievements of the Corinthians in other directions ought to be supplemented by this grace of giving. The Corinthians, according to the first epistle, had been very proud of their power of utterance and their knowledge. To these Paul could now add, after the loyalty of the church had finally been established, earnestness and love. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 6 to 8 But all these excellencies will be incomplete unless there is also liberality. The Christian life must express itself in the simpler graces if the more conspicuous activities are to be of genuine value. 3. No unfair burdens to be borne. The delicacy of Paul's treatment of the matter is absurd also in 2 Corinthians 8 verses 10 to 15. He is careful to explain that the Corinthians are not asked to lay unfair burdens upon themselves. There should be an equality among Christians. It is now time for the Corinthians to give rather than to receive. But if circumstances should change, they might count on the aid of their brethren. Furthermore, no one should be discouraged if he can give only a little. If the readiness is there, it is acceptable, according as a man hath, not according as he hath not. 4. Cheerful giving Paul urges his readers indeed to be bountiful. He that sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly and he that serve bountifully shall reap also bountifully. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 But this bountifulness was to be secured not by pressing out the last cent, but by promoting real cheerfulness in giving. Let each man do according as he have purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The Pauline method is wisest in the end. Men can seldom be bullied into liberality. They will give liberally only when giving becomes not a mere duty, but a joy. Cheerfulness in giving, moreover, possesses a value of its own, quite aside from the amount of the gift. It is a true expression of Christian communion. 5. The Unity of the Church Probably Paul desired to accomplish by the collection something even more important than the relief of the Jerusalem poor. Many Palestinian Christians, not only extreme Judaizers, but also apparently considerable numbers among the rank and file, had been suspicious of the Gentile mission. Acts 21, verses 20 and 21 Such suspicions would be allayed by deeds more effectively than by words. A generous offering for the poor of the Jerusalem church would show that Jews and Gentiles were really united in the bonds of Christian love.
2 Corinthians 9, verses 12 to 14. 6. The Glory of God Ultimately, however, the purpose of the collection, as of all other Christian activities, is to be found, according to Paul, in God. The ministration of this service not only fill up the measure of the wants of the saints, but abound of also through many thanksgivings unto God. The unity of the church, inspiring though it is, is desired not for its own sake, but for the sake of the glory of God. By the simple means of the collection, Paul hopes to present a united church, united in thanksgiving and in love, as some poor human return to him who has granted us all the unspeakable gift of salvation through his Son. 7. Sound Business Methods The arrangements which Paul made for the administration of the gifts are as instructive in their way as are the lofty principles that he applied. In order to avoid base suspicions, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 20, 12, verses 16 to 18, he determined that delegates appointed by the Corinthians themselves should carry the gifts to Jerusalem, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 3 and 4, as secured for the prosecution of the work in Corinth men who had the full endorsement of the churches. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 16 to 24. The lesson is worth learning. It will not do to be careless about the money matters of the church. It will not do to say that the church is above suspicion. Like Paul, we take thought for things honourable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. In other words, we must be not only honourable in managing the money affairs of the church, but also demonstratedly honourable. To that end, sound business methods should always be used. The accounts of the church should be audited not with less care, but if anything with more care, than those of ordinary business enterprises. 3. The Pauline Collection According to Romans in the epistle to the Romans written from Corinth a little after the time of Second Corinthians, Paul speaks of the collection again. Romans 15, verses 22 to 29, 31. He is on the point of going with the gifts to Jerusalem and asks the Roman Christians to pray that the ministration of the Gentiles may be acceptable to the saints. There is no reason to suppose that such prayers were unanswered. Paul was cordially received by the Jerusalem Christians. Acts 21, verses 17 to 26. The trouble which caused his arrest came for non-Christian Jews. 4. To whom was relief extended? 1. Breath of Christian sympathy. The relief of the needy in the apostolic church, as it has been studied in the present lesson, concerned not outsiders but Christian brethren. This fact certainly does not mean that the early Christians were narrow in their sympathies. They had received from Jesus the command to love their enemies, and the command was reiterated by the apostles. Romans 12, verse 20. They were commanded furthermore to work that which is good toward all men. Galatians 6, verse 10. 2. Special attention to Christian brethren. There are reasons, however, why such good work should be directed, especially toward them that are of the household of faith. a. The special rights of brethren. In the first place, there was a general reason which applies to all ages. Though the church has a duty to all men, it has a special duty to its own members. For Christian people to allow their brethren to starve is as unnatural as for a father to neglect a son or husband, a wife. Community in the faith does create a special bond, which would make itself felt in all departments of life. It should be observed that in the matter of the collection, all takes altogether for granted the right of the poor saints to the support of the church. He does not think it worthwhile to go into details about the suffering of the Jerusalem poor. He does not attempt to play upon the sympathies of his readers. He does not patronisingly represent the receipts of the bounty as paupers. Indeed, the Jerusalem Christians, he tells the Romans, 
though they are receiving material aid, are not really debtors but rather creditors. If the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, they owe it to them also to minister unto them in carnal things. Romans 15 verse 27 This attitude toward poorer Christians is worthy of all emulation. Aid to the brethren is not charity in the degraded sense which that fine word has unfortunately assumed, but a solemn and yet joyful duty. It should never be undertaken in a patronising spirit, but in a spirit of love that multiplies the value of the gift. b. Avoidance of idleness in the church. On the other hand, however, the apostolic church did not encourage begging or pauperism. What the special reason was for the poverty of the Jerusalem church we do not know. Perhaps many of the Jerusalem Christians had been obliged to leave their homes in Galilee and in the dispersion. At any rate, we may assume that the poverty of the church was not due to idleness. In the Thessalonian epistles, Paul takes occasion to warn his converts against an idle life. They are to do their own business and work at their hands. If any will not work, neither let him eat. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 10 to 12. 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 6 to 15. Certainly Paul was the best example of such diligence. Despite his wonderful gifts and lofty duties, he had made himself independent by manual labour. In the first epistle to Timothy, moreover, particular precautions are taken against allowing the bounty of the church to be abused. 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 to 16. The treatment of the poor in the apostolic church exhibits everywhere an admirable combination of common sense with lofty idealism. c. Conditions in the apostolic church and conditions today. If the gifts of the apostolic church were devoted chiefly to Christian brethren rather than to outsiders, that is no justification for such limitation today. In the apostolic age, there were special reasons why the church could not often deal extensively with the material needs of the world at large. The church was exceedingly poor. Many of the converts probably suffered serious losses by the very fact of their being Christians. Under such conditions, the first duty was obviously at home. Conditions today are widely different. The church has become wealthy. She is well able to extend her ministrations far and wide. Only by unlimited breadth of service will she really be true to the example of Jesus and of his first disciples. Only by universal helpfulness will she be true to her great commission. End of chapter 45「Chapter 46 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times by John Gresham Machen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by John Gresham Machen. Organizing for Service. Whatever the organization of a body of Christians may be, the body itself is a true branch of the church if it consists of those who believe in Christ. Nevertheless, if the church is to be more than an aggregation of individuals, if it is not only to be something, but also to do something, it requires some sort of organization. This fundamental need was clearly recognized in the apostolic age and it was met by certain provisions which we believe ought still to be followed. Those provisions, however, do not amount to anything like an elaborate constitution. They do not hinder adaptation to changing conditions. Section 1. Elders According to the Pastoral Epistles In the Pastoral Epistles, which afford more detailed information about organization than is to be found anywhere else in the New Testament, the government of the local church is seen to be entrusted to a body of elders, 
with whom deacons are associated. No one of the elders, so far as can be detected, possessed authority at all different in kind from the authority of the others. All had the function of ruling. All were overseers or bishops of the church. The functions of the elders are not described in detail, but evidently they had a general oversight over the affairs of the congregation. That is the meaning of the word bishop as it is applied to them. Some of them at least also labored in the word and in teaching, but all seem to have been alike in their function of bearing rule. Section 2. Elders According to the Presbyterian Form of Government The similarity of such an arrangement to our own Presbyterian form of government is plain. Our churches also are governed not by an individual, but by a body of elders, who are equal to one another in authority. Changing conditions have, of course, introduced elaboration of the simple apostolic model. Thus, the teaching function, for example, which in apostolic times was perhaps exercised more or less informally by those of the elders who possess the gifts for it, is now naturally assigned for the most part to men who have received a special training. These teaching elders in our church are the ministers. Conditions have become so complex that men of special training who devote their whole time to the work of the church are imperatively required. The pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4, 11, even in the apostolic church, seem to have formed a fairly definite group. This class of gifts is exercised today especially by the ministers, though similar functions should also be exercised by other members of the church. Section 3. How were elders to be chosen? With regard to the government of the apostolic church, a number of interesting questions can never be definitely answered. For example, how were the elders to be chosen? First, sometimes appointed by the apostles. Such passages as Acts 14.23, Titus 1.5 do not settle the question. According to the former passage, elders were appointed in the churches of southern Galatia by Paul and Barnabas. But it must be remembered that the authority of the apostles was peculiar and temporary. Because the apostles had power to appoint elders, it does not follow that any individuals at a later time would possess a similar power. The situation at the time of the first Christian mission was peculiar. Small bodies of Christians had just been rescued from heathenism. At first, they would need a kind of guidance, which could afterwards safely be withdrawn. According to Titus 1, 5, Titus was to appoint elders in the churches of Crete. But clearly Titus, like Timothy, was merely a special and temporary representative of the Apostle Paul. For Titus to appoint elders under the definite direction of Paul was no more significant than for Paul to appoint them himself. Second, the right of congregational election. On the whole, it may be confidently maintained that the Presbyterian method of choosing elders, namely the method of election by the whole congregation, is more in accordance with the spirit of apostolic precedent than any other method that has been proposed. Throughout the apostolic church, the congregation was evidently given a very large place in all departments of the Christian life. The Jerusalem congregation, for example, had a decisive voice in choosing the very first church officers who were known to have been added to the apostles. Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 6. In Thessalonica and in Corinth, the whole congregation was active in the matter of church discipline. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians Chapter 2, verse 6. The whole congregation was also invited to choose delegates for carrying the gifts of the Corinthian church to Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 16, 3. These are merely examples. It must be remembered, moreover, 
that the authority of the congregation in the apostolic age was limited by the authority of the apostles, which was special and temporary. When the apostles should be removed, the congregational functions would be increased. Yet even the apostles were exceedingly careful not to destroy the liberties of the rank and file. Nowhere in the apostolic church were the ordinary church members treated as though they were without rights and without responsibilities. Indeed, even when the apostles appointed elders, they may have previously ascertained the preferences of the people. Section 4. The Apostolic Precedent and Departures from It The presbyterial form of church government, that is, government by a body of elders, which is found in the apostolic age, differs strikingly from certain later developments. In several particulars, at least, principles have become prevalent which are at variance with the apostolic model. First, the monarchical episcopate. The first particular concerns the relation of the church officers to one another. In the apostolic church, as we have observed, there is a parity among the elders— The local congregation was governed not by an individual, but by a body. As early, however, as the first part of the second century, a change had taken place, at least in many of the churches. The supreme authority had come to be held by an individual called bishop. All other officers were clearly subordinate to him. The government of the local congregation was no longer presbyterial, but monarchical the so-called monarchical episcopate, had been formed. This state of affairs appears clearly in the epistles of Ignatius, which were written a short time before A.D. 117. But all attempts to find traces of the monarchical episcopate in the apostolic age have resulted in failure. The Greek word episkopos, which is translated in the English Bible, rather misleadingly, perhaps, by bishop, is applied not to a special officer standing above the elders, but simply to the elders themselves. Elder designates the office. Episcopos designates one function of the office. The latter word could hardly have been used in this general way if it had already acquired its technical significance. The efforts which had been made to discover references to the office of bishop in the apostolic age are unconvincing. It is exceedingly doubtful whether the angels of the seven churches to which messages are sent in the Apocalypse are to be regarded as church officers. And even if they were church officers, it is by no means clear that they exercised the functions of bishops. Undoubtedly, Timothy and Titus appear in the pastoral epistles with functions similar in many respects to those of bishops. But it is also clear that they exercise those functions not as officers of the church who might have successors, but merely as temporary representatives of the Apostle Paul. Second, the priesthood of the clergy. An even more important divergence from apostolic conditions concerns the functions of the church officers. According to a theory which has become widely prevalent, Certain officers of the church are to be regarded as priests, that is, they are mediators between God and man. Curiously enough, the English word priest is nothing but another form of the word presbyter, which means elder. Presbyter is only priest writ large. In actual usage, however, priest means vastly more than presbyter. It designates a man who represents men to God, and mediates God's actions to men. So understood, the term is never applied in the New Testament to the church officers as such. According to the New Testament, the only priest, in the strict sense, under the new dispensation, is Christ. Christ is the only mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5 The high priesthood of Christ is elaborated in the epistle to the Hebrews. In another sense, indeed, all believers are priests. First Peter chapter two, verses five and nine, Revelation chapter one, verse six, chapter five, verse ten, chapter twenty, verse six. 
All have the right of direct access to God. All are devoted to a holy service. The idea of a special priesthood in the Christian church is strikingly at variance with the apostolic teaching. Third, apostolic succession. Another point of variance concerns the manner in which the officers of the church should receive their authority. By a theory prevalent in the Church of England and the Protestant Episcopal Church in America, as well as the Greek and Roman Catholic churches, the authority of the clergy has been received through an unbroken line of transmission from the apostles. The immediate successors of the apostles received the right of handing down the commission to others, and so on through the centuries. Without an ordination derived in this way, no one can be a ruler in the true church, and without submission to such regularly ordained rulers, no body of persons can constitute a branch of the true church. This theory places a tremendous power in the hands of a definite body of persons whose moral qualifications for wielding that power are often more than doubtful. Surely so stupendous a claim can be made good only by the clear pronouncement of a recognized authority. Such a pronouncement is not to be found in the New Testament. There is not the slightest evidence to show that the apostles provided for a transmission of their authority through a succession of persons. On the contrary, their authority seems to have been special and temporary, like the miraculous powers with which they were endowed. The regular church officers who were appointed in the apostolic age evidently possessed no apostolic authority. However chosen, they were essentially representatives of the congregation. A true branch of the church could exist, at least in theory, without any officers at all, wherever true believers were together. The church did not depend upon the officers, but the officers upon the church. Section 5. Relations of the Congregations to One Another So far, the organization of the apostolic church has been considered only insofar as it concerned the individual congregation. A word must now be said about the relation of the congregations to one another. That relation in the apostolic age was undoubtedly very close. The Pauline epistles in particular give an impression of active intercourse among the churches. The Thessalonian Christians became an ensample to all that believe in Macedonia and in Achaia. The story of their conversion became known in every place. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. In the matter of the collection, Macedonia stirred up Achaia, and Achaia, Macedonia. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. The faith of the Roman Christians was proclaimed throughout the whole world. Romans 1, 8. Judea heard of the missionary labors of Paul. Galatians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Fellowship between Jews and Gentiles was maintained by the collection for the Jerusalem saints. Evidently, the apostolic church was animated by a strong sense of unity. This feeling of unity was maintained especially by the instrumentality of the apostles, who, with their helpers, traveled from one congregation to another and exerted a unifying authority over all. Certainly there is nothing like a universal church council. Christian fellowship was maintained in a thoroughly informal way. In order that such fellowship should be permanent, however, there would obviously be an increasing need for some sort of official union among the organizations. When the apostles passed away, their place would have to be taken by representative assemblies. Increasing complexity of life brought increasing need of organization. The representative assemblies of our own church, therefore, meet an obvious need, and both in their free representative character and in their unifying purpose, it may fairly be claimed that they are true to the spirit of the apostolic age. Section 6. Principles The apostolic precedent with regard to organization should always be followed in spirit as well as in form. 
Three principles especially are to be observed in the church organization of the apostolic age. In the first place, there was considerable freedom in details. No Christian who had gifts of any kind was ordinarily prevented from exercising them. In the second place, there was respect for the constituted authority, whatever it might be. Such respect, moreover, was not blind devotion to a ruling class, but the respect which is ennobled by love. Finally, in church organization, as in all the affairs of life, what was regarded as really essential was the presence of the Holy Spirit. When Timothy laid his hands upon a new elder, the act signified the bestowal of, or the prayer for, divine favor. This last lesson, especially, needs to be learned today. Without the grace of God, The best of church organizations is mere machinery without power. End of chapter 46. Chapter 47 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times by John Dressam Machen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by John Gresham Machen A Mission for the World Section 1. Judaism and Christianity In teaching the lesson in class, it might be well simply to review the principal steps in the geographical extension of the Apostolic Church. This geographical advance, however, was made possible only by an advance in principles which should not be ignored. The really great step in the early Christian mission was not the progress from Jerusalem to Antioch or from Antioch to Asia Minor and to Greece, but the progress from a national to a universal religion. Judaism, despite its missionary activity, always identified the church more or less closely with the nation. It was a distinctly national religion. Full union with it meant the abandonment of one's own racial and national relationships. First, the limitations of Judaism. The national character of Judaism was an insurmountable hindrance to the Jewish mission. Despite the hindrance, it is true, Judaism achieved important conquests. It won many adherents throughout the Greco-Roman world. These missionary achievements undoubtedly form an eloquent testimony to the power of Israel's faith. Despite those features of Jewish custom which were repulsive to the Gentile mind, the belief in the one true God and the lofty ethical ideal of the Old Testament scriptures possessed an irresistible attraction for many earnest souls. Nevertheless, so long as Jewish monotheism and Jewish ethics were centered altogether in the life of a very peculiar people, they could never really succeed in winning the nations of the world. Second, apparent identity of Judaism and Christianity. At first, it looked as though Christianity were to share in the limitation It looked as though the disciples of Jesus formed merely a Jewish sect. Undoubtedly, they would bring the Jewish people to a loftier faith and to a purer life. They would themselves become better and nobler Jews. But Jews, they would apparently always remain. Third, the Great Transition. Before many years had passed, however, the limitation was gloriously transcended. Christianity was no longer bound to Judaism. It became a religion for the world, within whose capacious borders there was room for every nation and every race. How was the transition accomplished? It was not accomplished by any contemptuous repudiation of the age-long exclusiveness of Israel. Such repudiation would have involved the discrediting of the Old Testament, and to the Old Testament, the church was intensely loyal. Jewish particularism had been ordered of God. The scriptures were full of warnings against any mingling of the chosen people with its neighbors, 
Jehovah had made of Israel a people alone. He had planted it in an inaccessible hill country, remote from the great currents of the world's thought and life. He had preserved its separateness even amid the changing fortunes of captivity and war. Salvation was to be found only in Israel. Israel was the chosen people. The church never abandoned this view of Israelitish history. Yet for herself, she transcended the particularism that it involved. She did so in a very simple way, merely by recognizing that a new era had begun. In the old era, particularism had a rightful place. It was no mere prejudice, but a divine ordinance. But now, in the age of the Messiah, particularism had given place to universalism. The religion of Israel had become a religion of the world. What had formerly been right had now become wrong. God himself had ushered in a new and more glorious dispensation. Particularism in the divine economy had served a temporary, though beneficent, purpose. God had separated Israel from the world in order that the precious deposit of Israel's faith, pure of all heathen alloy, might finally be given freely to all. The recognition of this wonderful new dispensation of God was accomplished in two ways. Section 2. The Divine Guidance In the first place, it was accomplished by the direct command of the Holy Spirit. The first preaching to the Gentiles was undertaken not because the missionaries understood why it should be done, but simply because God commanded First, Philip. For example, when Philip preached to the Ethiopian, who was not in the strictest sense a member of the Jewish people, he was acting not in accordance with any reflection of his own. A desert road was a very unlikely place for missionary service, but under the plain and palpable guidance of the Spirit. What is emphasized in the whole narrative is a strange, unaccountable character of Philip's movements, Evidently, his actions at such time were not open to criticism. What Philip did, God did. If Philip preached to an outsider, such preaching was God's will. Acts eight twenty six through 40 Second, Cornelius. In the case of the conversion of Cornelius and his friends, Acts 10, 1 to 11, 18, the divine warrant was just as plain. Both Cornelius and Peter acted together in accordance with God's guidance. On the housetop, Peter's scruples were unmistakably overcome. What God hath cleansed, he was told, make not thou common. Peter did not fully comprehend the strange command that he should eat what the law forbade, and it was not explained to him. But at least the command was a command of God, and must certainly be obeyed. The meaning of the vision became clear when Cornelius' house was entered. A Gentile had evidently been granted the offer of the gospel. God was no respecter of persons. Finally, the Holy Spirit fell on all the Gentiles who heard the message. They spake with tongues, as the disciples had done at the first. That was the crowning manifestation of God's will. There was no reason to wait for circumcision or union with the people of Israel. Can any man forbid the water, said Peter, that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Acts 10, 47. All opposition was broken down. Only one conclusion was possible. The Jerusalem Christians glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also hath God granted repentance unto life. Acts eleven eighteen. Third, the grace of God in the Gentile mission. Scarcely less palpable was the divine guidance in the subsequent developments of the Gentile mission. After the momentous step of certain unnamed Jews of Cyprus and Cyrene, who founded the church at Antioch, 
Barnabas had no difficulty in recognizing the grace of God. Acts 11.23 Not suspicion, but only gladness, was in place. When Paul and Barnabas returned from the first Gentile mission, they could report to the Antioch church that God had plainly opened a door of faith unto the Gentiles. Chapter 14, verse 27 If God had opened, who could close? At the Apostolic Council, in the very face of bitter opposition, the same great argument was used. The missionaries simply rehearsed all things that God had done with them. Chapter 15, 4 especially what signs and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles through them. Verse 12. There was only one thing to be done. The Gentile mission must be accepted with gladness as a gift of God. He that wrought for Peter unto the apostleship of the circumcision wrought for Paul also unto the Gentiles. Galatians 2, 8. James and Peter and John could recognize, both in the Gentile mission and in the inner life of the chief missionary, the plainest possible manifestation of the grace of God. Verse 9. Section 3. Reasons for Gentile Freedom The Church transcended the bounds of Judaism then, primarily because of a direct command of God. Such commands must be obeyed, whether they are understood or not. As a matter of fact, however, God did not leave the matter in such an unsatisfactory state. He revealed not only his will, but also the reason for it. He showed not only that the Gentiles must be received into the church, but also why they must be received. The essence of the gospel had demanded Gentile freedom from the beginning, The justification of that freedom at the bar of reason, therefore, brought a clearer understanding of the gospel itself. Two contrasts, at least, enabled the church to explain the reason why the Gentiles could be saved without becoming Jews. The first was the contrast between faith and works, between grace and the law. The second was the contrast between the type and the thing typified. The former was revealed especially to Paul, the latter to the author of Hebrews. First, the law and grace. Salvation through Christ, according to Paul, is an absolutely free gift. It cannot be earned. It must simply be received. In other words, it comes not by works, but by faith. The law of God, on the other hand, of which the Mosaic Law was the clearest embodiment, offers a different means of obtaining God's favor. It simply presents a series of commandments and offers salvation on condition that they be obeyed. But the trouble is, the commandments, since the fall, cannot be obeyed. Everyone has incurred deadly guilt through his disobedience. The power of the flesh is too strong. At that point, however, God intervened. He offered Christ as a sacrifice for sin, that all believers might have a fresh start. And he bestowed the spirit of the living Christ, that all might have strength to lead a new life. But Christ will do everything or nothing. A man must take his choice. There are only two ways of obtaining salvation. The perfect keeping of the law, or the simple, unconditional acceptance of what Christ has done. The first is excluded because of sin. The second has become a glorious reality in the church. If, however, salvation is through the free gift of Christ, then the law of religion has been superseded. All those features of the law, which were intended to make the law palpable as a set of external rules, are abrogated. The Christian, indeed, performs the will of God. In the deepest sense, Christianity only confirms the law, but he performs it, not by slavish obedience to a complex of external commandments, but by willing submission to the Spirit of God. 
Of course, the religion of the Old Testament was not, according to Paul, purely a law religion. On the contrary, Paul quotes the Old Testament in support of faith. But there was a law element in the Old Testament, and the law served merely a temporary, though beneficent, purpose. It was intended to deepen the sense of sin and hopelessness, in order that finally salvation might be sought, not in man's way, but in God's. The new order at length has come. In Christ, we are free men and should never return to the former bondage. The middle wall of partition has been done away. The ordinances of the law no longer separate Jew and Gentile. All alike have access through one Savior unto God. All alike receive power through the Holy Spirit to live a life in holiness and love. Second, the type and the fulfillment. The contrast which was worked out in the epistle to the Hebrews was especially a contrast between the sign and the thing signified. The ceremonial law, which had separated Jew from Gentile, was intended to point forward to Christ. And now that the fulfillment has come, what further need is there of the old types and symbols? Christ is the great high priest. By him, all alike can enter into the holy place. Third, the meaning of the gospel. The transition from Jewish Christianity, with all the difficulties of that transition, led finally to a deeper understanding of the gospel. It showed once for all that the salvation of the Christians is a free gift. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. These words are a good summary of the result of the Judaistic controversy. The transition showed, furthermore, what had really been felt from the beginning, that Christ was the one and all-sufficient Lord. When he was present, no other priest and no other sacrifice was required. That is the truly missionary gospel, the gospel that will finally conquer the world. End of chapter 47. Chapter 48 of The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen The Christian Ideal of Personal Morality In treating the lesson for today, the teacher will be embarrassed by the wealth of his material. It is important, therefore, that the chief purpose of the lesson should not be lost amid a mass of details. That chief purpose is the presentation of Christianity as something that has a very definite and immediate bearing upon daily life. Christianity is, first of all, a piece of good news, a record of something that has happened. But the effect of it, if it be sincerely received, is always manifest in holy living. Section 1. The Example of Jesus In the student's textbook, little attempt was made at detailed analysis of the apostolic ideal. The defect should be supplied by careful attention to the topics for study and also, if possible, by the treatment of the lesson in class. First of all, however, it should be observed how naturally the apostolic presentation of the ideal grows out of the teaching of Jesus. The advance which Revelation made after the close of Jesus' earthly ministry concerned the fuller explanation of the means by which the moral ideal is to be attained rather than additional exposition of the ideal itself. That does not mean that the apostles did no more in the field of ethics than quote the words of Jesus. Indeed, there seem to be surprisingly few direct quotations of the words of Jesus in the apostolic writings. The ethical teaching of the apostolic church was no mere mechanical repetition of words, but a profound application of principles. <clears throat> 
Nevertheless, the teaching of Jesus was absolutely fundamental. Without an examination of it, the moral life of the apostolic church cannot be fully understood. First, the inexorableness of the law. Jesus had insisted, for example, upon the inexorableness of the law of God. To the keeping of God's commandments, everything else must be sacrificed. If thy right eye causeth thee to stumble, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body be cast into hell. Matthew 5.29 In this respect, the apostles were true disciples of their master. The Christian, they insisted, must be absolutely ruthless. He must be willing to sacrifice everything he has for moral purity. This ruthlessness, however, this thoroughgoing devotion to moral purity, did not mean in the teachings of Jesus any more than in that of the apostles, that under ordinary conditions the Christian ought to withdraw from the simple pleasures that the world offers. Jesus himself took his place freely at feasts, So far was he from leading a stern, ascetic life that his enemies could even accuse him of being a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. The fidelity with which the apostles followed this part of their master's example has been pointed out in the student's textbook. The enjoyable things of the earth are not evil in themselves. They are to be received with thanksgiving as gifts of the Heavenly Father and then dedicated to his service. Second, the morality of the heart. Furthermore, Jesus, as well as his apostles, emphasized the inwardness of the moral law. Here again, the apostolic church was faithful to Jesus' teaching. The seat of sin was placed by the apostles in the very center of a man's life. The flesh and the spirit waged their warfare in the battlefield of the heart. See, for example, Galatians 5, 16 through 24. Section 2. Contrasts. The sharp difference between the Christian life and the life of the world was set forth in the apostolic teaching by means of various contrasts. First, death and life. In the first place, there was the contrast between death and life. The man of the world, according to the apostles, is not merely ill. He is morally and spiritually dead. Colossians 2, 13. Ephesians 2, 1 and 5. There is no hope for him in his old existence. That existence is merely a death in life. But God is one who can raise the dead. And as he raised Jesus from the tomb on the third day, so he raises those who belong to Jesus from the deadness of their sins. He implants in them a new life in which they can bring forth fruits unto God. A moral miracle, according to the New Testament, stands at the beginning of Christian experience. That miracle was called by Jesus himself, as well as by the apostles, a new birth or regeneration. It is no work of man. Only God can raise the dead. See John 1.13 3, 1 through 21, 1 John 2, 29, 1 Peter 1, 3 and 23. Second, darkness and light. The contrast between darkness and light also was common to the teaching of Jesus and that of his apostles. It appears particularly in the Gospel of John, but there are also clear traces of it in the Synoptists. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. The righteous are the sons of light. Luke 16, 8. In the writings of the apostles, the contrast appears in many forms. Ye are all sons of light, said Paul, and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep, as do the rest, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 and 6. Ye were once darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ephesians 5, 8.
God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. The contrast serves admirably to represent the honesty and openness and cleanness of the true Christian life. Third, flesh and spirit. An even more important contrast is the contrast of flesh and spirit, which is expounded especially by Paul. Flesh in this connection means something more than the bodily side of human nature. It means human nature as a whole so far as it is not subjected to God. Spirit also means something more than might be supposed on a superficial examination. It does not mean the spiritual, as distinguished from the material side of human nature, but the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The warfare, therefore, between the flesh and the spirit, which is mentioned so often in the Pauline epistles, is a warfare between sin and God. The flesh, according to God, is a mighty power, which is too strong for the human will. It is impossible for the natural man to keep the law of God. I know, says Paul, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but to do that which is good is not. I find then the law that to me who would do good, evil is present. For I delight in the law of God after my inward man, but I see a different law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity under the law of sin which is in my members. Romans seven eighteen and 21 through 23. In this recognition of the power of sin in human life, Paul has laid his finger upon one of the deepest facts in human experience. The way of escape, however, has been provided. Sin has been conquered in two aspects. It has been conquered in the first place in its guilt. Without that conquest, everything else would be useless. The dreadful subjection to the power of sin, which becomes so abundantly plain in evil habit, was itself a punishment for sin. Before the effect can be destroyed, The guilt which caused it must be removed. It has been removed by the sacrifice of Christ. Christ has died for us, the just for the unjust. Through his death, we have a fresh start in the favor of God, with the guilty past wiped out. Sin has been conquered, in the second place, in its power. Together with the very implanting of faith in our hearts, The Holy Spirit has given us a new life, a new power, by which we can perform the works of God. A mighty warfare indeed is yet before us, but it is fought with the Spirit's help, and by the Spirit it will finally be won. Fourth, the old man and the new. As the contrast between the flesh and the Spirit was concerned with the causes of the Christian's escape from sin, So the contrast now to be considered is concerned with the effects of that escape. The Christian, according to Paul, has become a new man in Christ. The old man has been destroyed. The Gentiles, he says, are darkened in their understanding and alienated from God. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. But ye did not so learn Christ. If so be that you heard him and were taught in him, even as truth is in Jesus, that ye put away as concerning your former manner of life the old man that waxeth corrupt after the lusts of deceit, and that ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, that after God hath been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Verses 20-24 through 24. Compare Colossians 3, 5 through 11. This putting on of the new man is included in what Paul elsewhere calls putting on Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27, Romans 13, verse 14. The true Christian has clothed himself with Christ. The lineaments of the old sinful nature have been transformed into the blessed features of the Master, Look upon the Christian, and what you see is Christ. 
This change has been wrought by Christ himself. It is no longer I that live, says Paul, but Christ liveth in me. Christ finds expression in the life of the Christian. It is noteworthy, however, that the putting on of Christ, which in Galatians 3.27 is represented as an accomplished fact, is in Romans 13.14 inculcated as a duty. It has been accomplished already in principle. In his sacrificial death, Christ has already taken our place in the sight of God. But the practical realization of it in conduct is a lifelong task which every earnest disciple, aided by the Holy Spirit, must prosecute with might and main. Section 3. The New Man Details in the character of the new man, as they are revealed in the apostolic writings, can here be treated only very briefly. First, honesty. Certainly the Christian, according to the apostles, must be honest. Honesty is the foundation of the virtues. Without it, everything else is based upon the sand. Nothing could exceed the fine scorn which the New Testament heaps upon anything like hypocrisy or deceit. The epistle in James, in particular, is a plea for profound reality in all departments of life. Away with all deceit. The Christian life is to be lived in the full blaze of God's sunlight. Many hours could be occupied in the class with the applications of honesty under modern conditions. Student life, for example, is full of temptations to dishonesty. To say nothing of out-and-out cheating, there are a hundred ways in which the fine edge of honor can be blunted. In business life, also, temptations are many. And indeed, no one can really escape the test. The apostolic example deserves to be borne in mind. Christian honesty ought to be more than the honesty of the world. Second, purity. In the second place, the apostolic church presents an ideal of purity. Purity in thought, as well as in word and deed. The ideal must have seemed strange to the degraded populations of Corinth and Ephesus, but it is also sadly needed today. Let us not deceive ourselves. He who would hold fellowship with Christ must put away impurity. Christ is the Holy One. Purity, however, is to be attained not by unaided human effort, but by the help of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, if he be admitted to the heart, will purge it of unclean thoughts. Third, patience and bravery. In the third place, patience and humility are prominent in the Christian ideal. These virtues are coupled, however, with the most vigorous bravery. There is nothing weak or sickly or sentimental about the Christian character. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. Be strong. 1 Corinthians sixteen thirteen. Fourth, love. The summation of the Christian ideal is love. Love, however, is more than a benevolent desire. It includes purity and heroism, as well as helpfulness. In order to love in the Christian sense, one must attain unto a full-grown man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 End of chapter 48 Chapter 49 of The Literature and History of New Testament Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen Chapter 49. Christianity and Human Relationships First, the problem. Two apparently contradictory features appear in the life of the apostolic church. In the first place, there was an intense otherworldliness. The Christians were regarded as citizens of a heavenly kingdom. In the second place, there was a careful attention to the various relationships of the present life. No man was excused from homely duty. The two sides of the picture appear in the sharpest colors in the life of the Apostle Paul. No one emphasized more strongly than he 
the independence of the Christian life with reference to the world. All Christians, whether their worldly station be high or low, are alike in the sight of God. The Church operates with entirely new standards of value. Yet, on the other hand, in his actual dealing with the affairs of this world, Paul observed the most delicate tact. And in all history, it is difficult to find a man with profounder natural affections. Where is there, for example, a more passionate expression of patriotic feeling than that which is to be found in Romans chapter nine, verse thirty-seven? I could wish that I myself were an anathema from Christ for my brethren's sake, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. On one hand, then, the apostolic church regarded all earthly distinctions as temporary and secondary. And yet, on the other hand, these same distinctions were very carefully observed. The apparent contradiction brings before us the great question of the attitude of Christianity toward human relationships. The question may be answered in one of three ways. Second, the worldly solution. In the first place, there is the worldly answer. The Christian finds himself in a world where his time and his thoughts seem to be fully occupied by what lies near at hand. The existence of God may not be denied, but practically, in the stress of more obvious duties, God is left out of account. One, practical Christianity, in its crude form, of course, where it involves mere engrossment in selfish pleasure, this answer to our question hardly needs refutation. Obviously, the Christian cannot devote himself to worldly enjoyment. A cardinal virtue of the Christian is self-denial. Worldliness in the church, however, may be taken in the wider sense. It has often assumed very alluring forms. At the present day, for example, it often represents itself as the only true, the only practical kind of Christianity. It is often said that true religion is identical with social service; that the service of one's fellow men is always worship of God. This assertion involves a depreciation of dogma in the interests of practical Christianity. It makes no difference, it is said, what a man believes, provided only he engages in the improvement of living conditions and the promotion of fairer laws. Two, this world is not all. This tendency in the church really makes religion a thing of this world only. Undoubtedly, much good is being accomplished by social workers who have given up belief in historic Christianity. But it is good that does not go to the root of the matter. Suppose we have improved condition on this earth. Suppose men have healthy employment and an abundance of worldly goods. Even so, the thought of death cannot be banished. Is the totality of man's happiness limited to a brief span of life? Are we, after all, but creatures of a day, or? Is there an eternal life beyond the grave, with infinite possibilities of good or evil? Jesus and his apostles and the whole of the apostolic church adopted the latter alternative. Three, the secularization of religion. We lay our finger here upon one of the points where the modern church is in danger of departing most fundamentally from the apostolic model. Religion is in serious danger of being secularized. That is. Of being regarded as concerned merely with this life, the only corrective is the recovery of the old conception of God. God is not merely another name for the highest aspirations of men; He is not merely the summation of the social forces which are working for human betterment. On the contrary, He is a living person working in the world, but also eternally independent of it. You can work for the worldly benefit of your fellow men without coming into any saving contact with God. It does not make a vast difference what you believe; it makes all the difference between death and life. Four, the teaching of Jesus and of the apostles. Only one-sided reading of the New Testament can find support for the opposite view. Jesus said, "Inasmuch as ye did it unto one of these my brethren, even these least ye did it unto me." Matthew chapter twenty-five verse forty. But the same Jesus also said, "If any man cometh unto me." And hateth not his own father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter fourteen verse twenty-six. The giving of a cup of cold water, which receives the blessing of Jesus, is done for one of these little ones, in the name of a disciple. Matthew chapter twenty verse forty-two. Evidently, the good works of the Christian 
are not independent of the attitude of the doer towards Jesus and towards God. Jesus regards the personal relation between himself and his disciples as one which takes precedence of even the holiest of earthly ties. Far more convincing, however, than any citation of definite passages, is the whole spirit of the New Testament teaching. Evidently, both Jesus and his early disciples had their lives determined by the thought of the living, personal God, holy and mysterious, and independent of the world. Social service exists for the sake of God, not God for the sake of social service. The reversal of this relationship is one of the most distressing tendencies of the present day. A study of the apostolic church may bring a return to sanity and humility. Third, the ascetic solution. The second answer to our question is the answer of ascetics of many different kinds. According to this answer, the relationship of the Christian to God on the one hand and his relationship to his fellow men on the other are in competition. Consequently, in order to strengthen the former, the latter must be broken off. In its extreme form, this way of thinking leads to the hermit ideal, to the belief that the less a man has to do with his fellow men, the more he has to do with God. Such conceptions are not always so uninfluential as we are inclined to think, even in our Protestant churches. Monasticism is not, indeed, consistently carried out, but it is often present in spirit and in principle. Some excellent Christians seem to feel that wholehearted, natural interest in earthly friends is disloyalty to Christ, that all men must be treated alike, that admission of one man into the depths of the heart more fully than another is contrary to the universality of the gospel. By such men, individuals are not treated as persons with a value of their own, but merely as opportunities for Christian service. 1. This solution defeats its own end. It is evident, in the first place, that such an attitude defeats its own aim. Evidently, the power of a Christian worker depends partly, at least, upon his interest in individuals. It will not do, for example, for the teachers in this course to let their students say, The teacher loves Christ supremely, but he has no interest in me. Evidently, the power of influencing our fellow men is largely increased by an intimate personal relationship. If we are to serve Christ by bringing men to his feet, then we ought not to dissolve, but rather to strengthen the bonds of simple affection which unite us to our human friends. 2. This solution is opposed to apostolic example. The example of the apostolic church points in the same direction. We have already noticed the intensity of natural affection, which was displayed even by a man so thoroughly and heroically devoted to Christian service as was the Apostle Paul. This example might well be supplemented, and supplemented most emphatically of all, by the example which lies at the basis of all the apostolic church, the example of Jesus himself. If any man might have been aloof from his fellow men, it was Jesus. Yet, as a matter of fact, he plainly had his earthly friends. Fourth, the true solution. The true solution of the problem is found in consecration. Human relationships are not to be made the sole aim of life, Neither are they to be destroyed, but they are to be consecrated to the service of God. Love for God under normal conditions comes into no competition with love for man, because God takes a place in the life which can never be filled by any human friend. By lopping off human friendships, we are not devoting ourselves more fully to God, but merely becoming less efficient servants of Him. 5. Christianity and Social Service Consecration of Human Relationships to God does not involve any depreciation of what is known today as social service. On the contrary, it gives to social service its necessary basis and motive power. Only when God is remembered is there an eternal outlook in the betterment of human lives. The improvement of social conditions, which gives the souls of men a fair chance, instead of keeping them stunted and balked by poverty and disease, is seen by him who believes in a future life and a final judgment, and heaven and hell, to have value not only for a time, but also for eternity. Not only for man, but also for the infinite God. 1. Society or the Individual It is sometimes regarded as a reproach that old-fashioned evangelical Christianity makes its first appeal to the individual. The success of certain evangelists has occasioned considerable surprise in some quarters, 
Everyone knows, it is said, that the social gospel is the really effective modern agency. Yet some evangelists, with only the very crudest possible social program, are accomplishing important and beneficent results. The lesson may be well learned, and it should never be forgotten. Despite the importance of social reforms, the first purpose of true Christian evangelism is to bring the individual man clearly and consciously into the presence of his God. Without that, all else is but of temporary value. The human race is composed of individual souls. The best of social edifices will crumble if all the materials are faulty. Two, every man should first correct his own faults. The true attitude of the Christian toward social institutions can be learned clearly from the example of the apostolic church. The first lesson that the early Christians learned when they faced the ordinary duties of life was to make the best of the institutions that were already existing. There was nothing directly revolutionary about the apostolic teaching. Sharp rebuke, indeed, was directed against the covetousness of the rich. But the significant fact is that such denunciations of wealthy men were addressed to the wealthy men themselves and not to the poor. In the apostolic church, every man was made to know his own faults, not the faults of other people. The rich were rebuked for their covetousness and selfishness. But the poor were commanded, with just as much vehemence, to labor for their own support. If any will not work, said Paul, neither let him eat. Second Thessalonians chapter three verse ten. In short, apostolic Christianity sought to remove the evils of an unequal distribution of wealth, not by a violent uprising of the poor against the rich, but by changing the hearts of the rich men themselves. Modern reform movements are often very different. But it cannot be said that the apostolic method is altogether antiquated. Three, the ennobling of existing institutions. Certainly, the apostolic method has been extraordinarily successful. It has accomplished far more than could have been accomplished by a violent reform movement. A good example is afforded by the institution of slavery. Here, if anywhere, we might seem to have an institution which was contrary to the gospel. Yet Paul sent back a runaway slave to his master. And evidently, without the slightest hesitation or compunction, that action was a consistent carrying out of the principle that a Christian man, instead of seeking an immediate change in his social position, was first of all to learn to make the best of whatever position was his already. Let each man abide in that calling wherein he was called. Wast thou called being a bond servant? Care not for it. Nay, even if thou canst become free, use it rather. For he that was called in the Lord, being a bond servant, is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he that was called being free, is Christ's bond servant. Ye were bought with a price; become not bond servants of men. Brethren, let each man wherein he was called therein abide with God. First Corinthians chapter seven, verses twenty through twenty-four. The freedom of the Christian, in other words. Is entirely independent of freedom in this world. A slave can be just as free in the higher spiritual sense as his earthly master. In this way, the position of the slave was ennobled. Evidently, the relation of Onesimus to Philemon was expected to afford both slave and master genuine opportunity for the development of Christian character and for the performance of Christian service. Four, the substitution of good institutions for bad. In the long run, however, such conceptions were bound to exert a pervasive influence, even upon earthly institutions. If Philemon really adopted the Christian attitude toward one who was now more than a servant, a brother, beloved in Christ, then in the course of time he would naturally desire to make even the outward relationship conform more perfectly to the inward spiritual fact. The final result would naturally be emancipation. And such was the actual process in the history of the church. Slavery, moreover, is only an example. A host of other imperfect social institutions have similarly been modified or removed. What a world of progress, for example, is contained in Galatians chapter three, verse twenty-eight. There can be neither Jew nor Greek. There can be neither bond nor free. There can be no male and female, for ye are all one man in Christ Jesus. Not battles and revolutions, the taking of cities and the pulling down of empires, are the really great events of history. 
but rather the enunciation of great principles such as this. Ye are all one man in Christ Jesus. These words, with others like them, have moved armies like puppets, and will, finally, transform the face of the world. End of chapter 49 Recording by Olivia Chapter 50 of The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. The Christian Use of the Intellect. Section 1. The Problem of Christianity and Culture The last two lessons have emphasized the duty of consecration. The enjoyment of simple physical blessings, the opportunities afforded by earthly relationships, are all to be devoted to the service of God. Exactly the same principle must be applied in the lesson for today. If physical health and strength and the companionship of human friends may be made useful in the Christian life, surely the same thing is true of intellectual gifts. The most powerful thing that a man possesses is the power of his mind. Brute force is comparatively useless. The really great achievements of modern times have been accomplished by the intellect. If the principle of consecration is true at all, if it be true that God desires not the destruction of human powers, but the proper use of them, then surely the principle must be applied in the intellectual sphere. The field should not be limited too narrowly. With the purely logical and acquisitive faculties of the mind should be included the imagination and the sense of beauty. In a word, we have to do today with the relationship between culture and Christianity. For the modern church, there is no greater problem. A mighty civilization has been built up in recent years, which to a considerable extent is out of relation to the gospel. Great intellectual forces which are rampant in the world are grievously perplexing the church. The situation calls for earnest intellectual effort on the part of Christians. Modern culture must either be refuted as evil or else be made helpful to the gospel. So great a power cannot be safely ignored. First, the obscurantist solution. Some men in the church are inclined to choose a simple way out of the difficulty. They are inclined to reject the whole of modern culture as either evil or worthless. This wisdom of the world they maintain must be deserted for the divine foolishness of the gospel. Undoubtedly, such a view contains an element of truth, but in its entirety, it is impracticable. The achievements of modern culture are being made useful for the spread of the gospel by the very advocates of the view now in question. These achievements, therefore, cannot be altogether the work of Satan. It is inconsistent to use the printing press, the railroad, the telegraph in the propagation of our gospel and at the same time denounce as evil those activities of the human mind by which these inventions were produced. Indeed, much of modern culture, far from being hostile to Christianity, has really been produced by Christianity. Such Christian elements should not be destroyed. The wheat should not be rooted up with the tares. Second, the worldly solution. If, however, the Christian man is in danger of adopting a negative attitude toward modern culture, of withdrawing from the world into a sort of unhealthy, modernized intellectual monastery, the opposite danger is even more serious. The most serious danger is the danger of being so much engrossed in the wonderful achievements of modern science that the gospel is altogether forgotten. Third, the true solution. The true solution is consecration. Modern culture is a stumbling block when it is regarded as an end in itself. But when it is used as a means to the service of God, it becomes a blessing. 
Undoubtedly, much of modern thinking is hostile to the gospel. Such hostile elements should be refuted and destroyed. The rest should be made subservient, but nothing should be neglected. Modern culture is a mighty force. It is either helpful to the gospel or else it is a deadly enemy of the gospel. For making it helpful, neither wholesale denunciation nor wholesale acceptance is in place. Careful discrimination is required, and such discrimination requires intellectual effort. There lies a supreme duty of the modern church. Patient study should not be abandoned to the men of the world. People who have really received the blessed experience of the love of God in Christ must seek to bring that experience to bear upon the culture of the modern world in order that Christ may rule, not only in all nations, but also in every department of human life. The church must seek to conquer not only every man, but also the whole of man. Such intellectual effort is really necessary even to the external advancement of the kingdom. Men cannot be convinced of the truth of Christianity so long as the whole of their thinking is dominated by ideas which make acceptance of the gospel logically impossible. False ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel, and false ideas cannot be destroyed without intellectual effort. Such effort is indeed of itself insufficient. No man was ever argued into Christianity. The renewing of the Holy Spirit is the really decisive thing. But the Spirit works when and how he will, and he chooses to employ the intellectual activities of Christian people in order to prepare for his gracious coming. Section 2. The Apostolic Example Abundant support for what has just been said may be discovered in the history of the Apostolic Church. Paul's speech at Athens, for example, shows how the Christian preacher exhibited the connection between the gospel and the religious aspirations of the time. This line of thought, it is true, was merely preliminary. The main thing with which the apostles were concerned was the presentation and explanation of the gospel itself. Such presentation and explanation, however, certainly required intellectual effort, and the effort was not avoided. The epistles of Paul are full of profound thinking. Only superficiality can ignore the apostolic use of the intellect. First, Christianity based upon facts. The fundamental reason why this intellectual activity was so prominent in the apostolic age is that the apostles thought of Christianity as based upon facts. Modern Christians sometimes cherish a different notion. A false antithesis is now sometimes set up between belief and practice. Christianity, it is said, is not a doctrine, but a life. In reality, Christianity is not only a doctrine, but neither is it only a life. It is both. It is, as has been well said, a life because it is a doctrine. What is characteristic of Christianity is not so much that it holds up a lofty ethical ideal as that it provides the power by which the ideal is to be realized. That power proceeds from the great facts upon which Christian belief is founded, especially the blessed facts of Christ's atoning death and triumphant resurrection. When belief in these facts has been lost, the Christian life may seem to proceed for a time as before, but it proceeds only as a locomotive runs after the steam has been shut off. The momentum is soon lost. If, however, Christianity is based upon facts, it cannot do without the use of the mind. Whatever may be said of mere emotions, facts cannot be received without employment of the reason. Christian faith is indeed more than intellectual. It involves rejoicing in the heart and acceptance by the will, but the intellectual element in it can never be removed. We cannot trust in Christ, in the Christian sense, unless we are convinced that he lived a holy life when he was on earth, that he claimed justly to be divine, that he died on the cross, 
and then he rose again from the dead. Second, Christianity involves theology. Furthermore, Christian faith involves not only a bare acceptance of these facts, it involves also some explanation of them. That explanation can never be complete. The gospel contains mysteries in the presence of which only wondering reverence is in place. But some explanation there must be. It is quite useless, for example, to know merely that a holy man, Jesus, died on the cross. It is even useless to know that the Son of God came to earth and died in that way. The death of Christ has meaning for us only because it was a death for our sins. The story of the cross becomes a gospel only when the blessed meaning of it is explained. The explanation of that meaning forms the subject of a large part of the New Testament. The apostolic church had none of our modern aversion to theology. It is time for us to return to the apostolic example. Mere bustling philanthropy will never conquer the world. The real springs of the church's power lie in an inward spiritual realm. They can be reached only by genuine meditation. The eighth chapter of Romans has been neglected long enough. Neglect of it is bringing deadly weakness. Instead of adapting her message to the changing fashions of the time, the church should seek to understand the message itself. The effort will not be easy. In a practical age, honest thinking is hard, but the results will be plain. Power lies in the deep things of God. Third, the duty of every man. The great intellectual duty of the modern church is not confined to a few men of scholarly tastes. On the contrary, the simplest Christian may have his part. What is needed, first of all, is common sense. By an unhealthy sentimentalism, old-fashioned study has been discredited. If God is speaking in the Bible, surely the logical thing for us to do is to hear Yet modern Christians are strangely neglectful of this simple duty. Bible study is regarded as of less importance than social service. Improvement of earthly conditions is preferred to acquaintance with God's word. The evil may be easily corrected, and it may be corrected, first of all, by the old-fashioned reading of the Bible. That requires intellectual effort. There is no use in turning the pages if the mind is elsewhere but the effort can be made by the plain man as well as by the scholar. Simple acquaintance with the Bible facts by the rank and file of the church will accomplish as much as anything else toward meeting the arguments of opponents. By learning what Christianity is, we should be able, almost unconsciously, to refute what can be said against it. Section 3. The Practice of the Truth this intellectual effort, however, should never be separated from practice. The best way to fix truth in the mind is to practice it in life. If our study teaches us that God is holy, let us hate sin as God hates it. If we learn that God is loving, let us love our fellow man as God loves them. If the Bible tells us of the salvation offered by Christ, let us accept it with a holy joy and live in the power of it day by day. That is the true practical Christianity, a Christianity that is based solidly upon facts. Conduct goes hand in hand with doctrine. Love is a sister of truth. Section 4. God, the Source of Truth The ultimate source of all truth, as of all love, is God. The knowledge for which we are pleading can never result in pride, for it is a knowledge that God gives, and a knowledge consecrated at every point to God's service. Presumptuous reliance upon human wisdom comes from knowledge that ignores part of the facts. True science leads to humility. If we accept all other facts, but ignore the supreme fact of God's love in Jesus Christ, then, of course, our knowledge will be one-sided. It may succeed in producing creature comforts. It may improve the external conditions of life upon this earth. 
It may afford purely intellectual pleasure, but it will never reveal the really important things. This one-sided knowledge is what Paul was speaking of in 1 Corinthians 1.21, when he said that the world, through its wisdom, knew not God. The true wisdom takes account of the foolishness of God's message and finds that that foolishness is wiser than men. The true wisdom of the gospel is revealed only through the Holy Spirit. Only the Spirit of God can reveal the things of God. Without the Spirit, the human mind becomes hopeless in dismal error. It is the Spirit of truth who sheds the true light over our path. O grant us light that we may know the wisdom thou alone canst give, that truth may guide where'er we go, and virtue bless where'er we live. End of chapter 50. Chapter 51 of the Literature and History of New Testament Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. The Christian Hope and the Present Possession. A type of religious effort has become prevalent today, which is directed chiefly to the present life. The improvement of worldly conditions is often regarded as the chief end of man. All such tendencies are strikingly at variance with apostolic Christianity. The apostolic church was intensely otherworldly. The chief gift that the apostles offered was not a better and more comfortable life in this world, but an entrance into heaven. Section 1. The End of the World Only the great outlines of the events connected with the end of the world are revealed in the New Testament. Minute details cannot be discovered except by an excessively literal method of interpretation, which is not really in accord with the meaning of the apostolic writers. Some have supposed, for example, that there are to be two resurrections. First, a resurrection of the Christian dead, and long afterwards, a resurrection of other men. Expectation of a thousand-year reign of Christ upon earth has been widely prevalent. Such beliefs are not to be lightly rejected, since they are based upon an interpretation of certain New Testament passages which is not altogether devoid of plausibility. But on the whole, they are at least doubtful in view of other passages, and especially in view of the true nature of prophecy. God has revealed not details to satisfy our curiosity, but certain basal facts which should determine our lives. Those basal facts connected with the end of the world are a second coming of Christ, a resurrection of the dead, a final judgment, an eternity of punishment for the wicked, and of blessing for those who have trusted in Christ. It is not maintained that these facts stand absolutely alone. Certainly, they are fully explained, at least in their spiritual significance, but the devout Bible reader should be cautious about his interpretation of details. Section 2. Fear and Joy The practical effect of the apostolic teaching about the end of the world should be a combination of earnestness with joy. A man who lives under the expectation of meeting Christ as judge will desert the worldly standard of values for a higher standard. He will rate happiness and worldly splendor lower in order to place the supreme emphasis upon goodness. The difference between evil and good, between sin and holiness, is not a trifle, not a thing of merely relative importance, as many men regard it. It enters deep into the constitution of the universe, It is a question of really eternal moment. Again and again in the New Testament, the thought of Christ's coming and of the judgment which he will hold is made the supreme motive to a pure and holy life. The apostolic example may well be borne in mind. When we are tempted to commit a mean or dishonest or unclean act, 
when unholy thoughts crowd in upon us like a noisome flood. We cannot do better than think of the day when we shall stand in the presence of the pure and holy judge. On the other hand, the thought of Christ's coming is to the believer the source of inexpressible joy. Christ has saved us from a terrible abyss. Our joy in salvation is in proportion to our dread of the destruction from which we have been saved. To the truly penitent man, the thought of the righteous God is full of terror. God is holy. We would sometimes endeavor vainly to shrink from his presence. Yet such a God has stretched out his hand to save. There is the wonder of the gospel. And if we trust in the Savior, the last great day need cause no fear. We are lost in sin, but God looks not upon us, but upon him who died to save us. Salvation to the apostolic church meant rescue, rescue from the just and awful judgment of God. Section 3. The Intermediate State The time of that judgment has not been revealed, but so far as any offer of repentance is concerned, the time comes to every man at death. One question of detail cannot altogether be ignored. What do the apostles teach about the condition of the believer between death and the final resurrection? Upon this subject, the New Testament says very little, but it becomes clear, at least, that the believer, even when absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and that to die is to be with Christ, Philippians 1, 23. On the whole, no better statement of the apostolic teaching about the intermediate state can be formulated than that which is contained in the shorter catechism. The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory, and their bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves till the resurrection. The hope of an immediate entrance into bliss at the time of death should not be allowed, however, to obscure the importance of the resurrection. The resurrection of the body will be necessary to the full enjoying of God to all eternity. Section 4. The Final Blessedness That enjoying of God is no mere selfish pleasure. It means, first of all, a triumph of holiness. Every last vestige of evil will be removed. No taint of sin will separate the redeemed creature from his God. Service will be free and joyous. The consummation, moreover, will concern not merely individuals, but the race. No mere expectation of the personal immortality of individuals begins to do justice to the apostolic teaching. The ultimate end, indeed, is not our own enjoyment but the glory of God. Some carnal, materialistic conceptions of the future age would really remove God from his own heaven, but such is not the teaching of the New Testament. God will be all and in all. Only in his glory is to be found the true glory of a redeemed race. The power of loving God is the highest joy that heaven contains. Section 5 the dispensation of the Spirit. The present age, according to the New Testament, is a time of waiting and striving. It is related to the future glory as a battle is related to the subsequent victory. Satisfaction with the present life, even as it is led by the best of Christians, would to the apostles have been abhorrent. The Christian is still far from perfect. A prime condition of progress is a divine discontent. Jesus pronounced a blessing upon them that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Eternal things to us are unseen. They can be discovered only by the eye of faith. We long for a time when hope will be supplanted by sight. Nevertheless, there is no room for despondency. The blessed time is surely coming. Its coming is rendered certain by the presence here and now of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit may be relied upon to prepare us both in soul and in body. 
for the glory of heaven. First, the Spirit in the Old Testament and in the life of Jesus. The Spirit of God was mentioned even in the Old Testament. At the beginning, he moved upon the face of the waters, Genesis 1, 2. He was the source of the mighty deeds of heroes and of the prophets' inspired words. In the life and teaching of Jesus, however, the Spirit was far more fully revealed than he had ever been revealed before. He was a source of Jesus' human nature, Matthew 1, verses 18 and 20, Luke 1, 35. He descended upon the newly proclaimed Messiah, Matthew three sixteen, and was operative in all the earthly ministry of the Lord. Second, the Spirit in the Church. For the disciples, however, the full glory of the Spirit's presence was manifested only after Jesus himself had been taken up into heaven. The present age, from Pentecost to the second coming of the Lord, is peculiarly the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Discontent with the Church's imperfections and dismay at her many adversaries should never cause us to lose confidence in the work that is being done by the Spirit of God. It was expedient that Jesus should go away. Through the other Comforter whom he has sent, he manifests himself even more gloriously than he did to the disciples in Galilee. Third, the nature of the Spirit. The apostles never discussed the nature of the Holy Spirit in any thoroughly systematic way. But two great facts are really presupposed in the whole New Testament. In the first place, the Holy Spirit is God. And in the second place, he is a person distinct from the Father and from the Son. The divinity of the Spirit appears, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2.11. The point of that verse is that the Spirit is as closely related to God as a human spirit is to a man. For who among men knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the things of God none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. The distinct personality of the Spirit appears with special clearness in Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. There the Spirit is represented as making intercession with him that searcheth the hearts. The one who intercedes is personally distinct from him before whom he makes intercession. Even more convincing, perhaps, is the great promise of Christ in John fourteen sixteen, and verses 17 and 26. Chapter 15, 26, chapter 16, verses 7 through 15, where the other comforter is spoken of in clearly personal terms and is distinguished both from the Father and from the Son. Personal distinctness, however, is not inconsistent with a perfect unity of nature. What the Spirit does, the Son and the Father do. When the other comforter comes to the church, Christ himself comes. The doctrine of the Trinity is a profound mystery, but its mysteriousness is no obstacle to the acceptance of its truth. Mystery in the depths of God's nature is surely to be expected. This mystery, taught by the pen of inspired writers, has brought salvation and peace into the lives of men. Distinctly Trinitarian passages, such as Matthew 28, 19, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, are merely a summation of the New Testament teaching about God, and that teaching has worked itself out in unspeakable blessing in the life of the Church. Fourth, the work of the Spirit. A complete summary of the belief of the Apostolic Church about the work of the Holy Spirit would be impossible in one brief lesson. The Christian life is begun by the Spirit and continued by his beneficent power. Conversion, according to Jesus and his apostles, is only the manward aspect of a profound change in the depths of the soul. That change is regeneration, a new birth. Christian experience is no mere improvement of existing conditions, 
but the entrance of something entirely new. Man is not merely sick in trespasses and sins, but dead. Only a new birth will bring life. That new birth is a mysterious, creative act of the Spirit of God. John 3, verses 3 through 8. But the Spirit does not leave those whom he has regenerated to walk alone. He dwells in them and enables them to overcome sin. The motive of his work is love. He is no blind force, but a loving person. The Christian can enjoy a real communion with him, as with the Father and the Son. In the presence of the Spirit, we have communion with God. The persons of the Godhead are united in a manner far beyond all human analogies. There is no imperfect medium separating us from the divine presence. By the gracious work of the Holy Spirit, we come into vital contact with the living God. The Spirit is the ground and cause of the Christian freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For ye received not the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8, verses 14 and 15. This liberty that the Spirit brings is, however, not a liberty to sin. It is liberation from sin. The body of the Christian is a temple of the Holy Spirit. In that temple, only purity is in place. The inward power of the Holy Spirit in the heart is more powerful than the law. If a man yields to that power, he will overcome the flesh. The law of God is fulfilled by those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. End of chapter 51 Section 52 of The Literature and History of New Testament Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen. Retrospect. The First Christian Century. The apostolic example can be applied intelligently to the problems of our time, only if there be some understanding of the intervening centuries. We are connected with the apostolic church by an unbroken succession. A study of church history would help us apply the New Testament teaching to our own age. The Christian writings, which have been preserved from the early part of the second century, show a marked decline from the spiritual level of the apostles. Evidently, the special inspiration which had made the New Testament a guide for all ages had been withdrawn. Yet the Spirit of God continued to lead the church. Even in the darkest periods of church history, God did not forget his people. Only scanty Christian writings have been preserved from the first three quarters of the second century. The extant works of the so-called apostolic fathers and of the apologists are of limited extent. About the close of the century, however, the record becomes more complete, Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus of Asia Minor and Gaul, and Tertullian of North Africa give a varied picture of the Christian life of the time. The church had gained rapidly in influence since the conclusion of the apostolic age. Persecutions had not succeeded in checking her advance. Finally, under Constantine in the first part of the fourth century, Christianity became the favoured religion of the Roman Empire. About the same time, in A.D. 325, the first ecumenical council at Nicaea undertook the work of formulating the belief of the church. The creeds which were adopted at the great ancient councils are accepted today in all parts of Christendom. During the same general period, the power of the Bishop of Rome was gradually increased until it culminated in the papacy. After the conquest of the western part of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, Christianity was accepted by the barbarian conquerors, and during the dark ages that followed, the church preserved the light of learning and piety until a better day should dawn. During the Middle Ages, though there was for the most part little originality in Christian thinking, great scholars and theologians formed striking exceptions to the general condition. <laughs> 
the political power of the papacy became enormous, but was hindered by the personal weakness and immorality of many of the popes. The degraded moral and spiritual condition of the church was counteracted here and there by the establishment of monastic orders, whose purpose at the beginning was good, by the writings of certain mystics, and by the work of the three pre-reformers, Wycliffe in England, Huss in Bohemia, and Savonarola in Italy. A genuine advance, however, did not come until the Reformation of the 15th century, when Luther in Germany and Zwingli in Switzerland, almost at the same time and at first independently, became the leaders in a mighty protest. A little later, Calvin carried out the principles of the Reformation in a comprehensive theological system, and by the power of his intellect and the fervency of his piety exerted an enormous influence throughout the world. The Reformation was distinctly a religious movement, though it had been prepared for by that revival of learning which is called the Renaissance. The work of Luther was a rediscovery of Paul, not the performance of a set of external acts prescribed by the church, but, as Paul taught, the grace of God received by faith alone is, according to Luther, the means of salvation. The Reformation brought about a counter-reformation in the Roman Catholic Church, and the Western European world was finally divided between the two great branches of Christendom. After a period of controversy and wars between Protestants and Catholics, the Church was called upon to fight a great battle against unbelief. That battle, begun in its modern form about the middle of the 18th century, continues unabated until the present day. We are living in a time of intellectual changes. To maintain the truth of the gospel at such a time and to present it faithfully and intelligently to the modern world is the supreme task of the Church. The task, to some extent, has been accomplished, and the missionary movement of the 19th and 20th centuries attests the vitality of the ancient faith. God has not deserted his church. There are enemies without and within. Compromise will surely bring disaster, but the gospel of Christ has not lost its power. This is not the first time of discouragement in the history of the church. The darkest hour has always been followed by the dawn. Who can tell what God has now in store? End of section 52 End of The Literature and History of New Testament Times by J. Gresham Machen